has he not a right to vote wrong? If a man has a right to choose his wife, has he not a right to choose wrong? I have a right to express the opinion which I am now setting down, but I should hesitate to make the controversial claim that this proves the opinion to be right. Now, medieval monarchy, though only one aspect of medieval rule, was roughly represented in the idea that the ruler had a right to rule as a voter has a right to vote. He might govern wrong, but unless he governed horribly and extravagantly wrong, he retained his position of right, as a private man retains his right to marriage and locomotion unless he goes horribly and extravagantly off his head. It was not really even so simple as this, for the Middle Ages were not, as it is often the fashion to fancy, under a single and steely discipline. They were very controversial and therefore very complex, and it is easy, by isolating items, whether about jus divinium or primus inter pares, to maintain that the medievals were almost anything. It has been seriously maintained that they were all Germans. But it is true that the influence of the church, though by no means of all the great churchmen, encouraged the sense of a sort of sacrament of government which was meant to make the monarch terrible and therefore often made the man tyrannical. The disadvantage of such depotism is obvious enough. The precise nature of its advantage must be better understood than it is, not for its own sake, so much as for the story we have now to tell. The advantage of divine right or irremovable legitimacy is this that there is a limit to the ambitions of the rich. Rua neni puis, the royal power, whether it was or was not the power of heaven, was in one respect like the power of heaven. It was not for sale. Constitutional moralists have often implied that a tyrant and a rabble have the same vices. It has perhaps been less noticed that a tyrant and a rabble most emphatically have the same virtues. And one virtue which they very markedly share is that neither tyrants nor rabbles are snobs. They do not care a button what they do to wealthy people. It is true that tyranny was sometimes treated as coming from the heavens almost in the lesser and more literal sense of coming from the sky. A man no more expected to be the king than to be the west wind or the morning star. But at least no wicked miller can chain the wind to turn only his own mill. No pedantic scholar can trim the morning star to be his own reading lamp. Yet something very like this is what really happened to England in the later Middle Ages. And the first sign of it, I fancy, was the fall of Richard II. Shakespeare's historical plays are something truer than historical. They are traditional. The living memory of many things lingered, though the memory of others was lost. He is right in making Richard II incarnate the claim to divine right and Bolingbroke the baronial ambition which ultimately broke up the old medieval order. But divine right had become at once drier and more fantastic by the time of the Tudors. Shakespeare could not recover the fresh and popular part of the thing, for he came at a later stage in a process of stiffening, which is the main thing to be studied in later medievalism. Richard himself was possibly a wayward and exasperating prince, it might well be the weak link that snapped in the strong chain of the Plantagenets. There may have been a real case against the coup d'etat which he effected in 1397, and his kinsman Henry of Bolingbroke may have had strong sections of disappointed opinion on his side when he effected in 1399 the first true usurpation in English history. But if we wish to understand that larger tradition which even Shakespeare had lost, we must glance back at something which befell Richard even in the first years of his reign. It was certainly the greatest event of his reign, and it was possibly the greatest event of all the reigns which are rapidly considered in this book. The real English people, 
The men who work with their hands lifted their hands to strike their masters, probably for the first and certainly for the last time in history. Pagan slavery had slowly perished, not so much by decaying as by developing into something better. In one sense it did not die, but rather came to life. The slave owner was like a man who should set up a row of sticks for a fence, and then find they had struck root and were budding into small trees. They would be at once more valuable and less manageable, especially less portable, and such a difference between a stick and a tree was precisely the difference between a slave and a serf, or even the free peasant which the serf seemed rapidly tending to become. It was, in the best sense of a battered phrase, a social evolution, and it had the great evil of one. The evil was that while it was essentially orderly, it was still literally lawless. That is, the emancipation of the commons had already advanced very far, but it had not yet advanced far enough to be embodied in a law. The custom was unwritten, like the British Constitution, and, like that evolutionary, not to say evasive, entity, could always be overridden by the rich, who now drive their great coaches through acts of parliament. The new peasant was still legally a slave, and was to learn it by one of those turns of fortune which confound a foolish faith in the common sense of unwritten constitutions. The French wars gradually grew to be almost as much of a scourge to England as they were to France. England was despoiled by her own victories. Luxury and poverty increased at the extremes of society, and, by a process more proper to an ensuing chapter, the balance of the better medievalism was lost. Finally, a furious plague, called the Black Death, burst like a blast on the land, thinning the population and throwing the work of the world into ruin. There was a shortage of labour, a difficulty of getting luxuries, and the great lords did what one would expect them to do. They became lawyers and upholders of the letter of the law. They appealed to a rule already nearly obsolete to drive the serf back to the more direct servitude of the Dark Ages. They announced their decision to the people, and the people rose in arms. The two dramatic stories which connect Watt Tyler doubtfully with the beginning and definitely with the end of the revolt, are far from unimportant, despite the desire of our present prosaic historians to pretend that all dramatic stories are unimportant. The tale of Tyler's first blow is significant in the sense that it is not only dramatic but domestic. It avenged an insult to the family and made the legend of the whole riot, whatever its incidental indecencies, a sort of demonstration on behalf of decency. This is important, for the dignity of the poor is almost unmeaning in modern debates, and an inspector need only bring a printed form and a few long words to do the same thing without having his head broken. The occasion of the protest and the form which the feudal reaction had first taken was a poll tax, but this was but a part of a general process of pressing the population to servile labour, which fully explains the ferocious language held by the government after the rising had failed. The language in which it threatened to make the state of the serf more servile than before. The facts attending the failure in question are less in dispute. The medieval populace showed considerable military energy and cooperation, stormed its way to London and was met outside the city by a company containing the king and the Lord Mayor, who were forced to consent to a parley. The treacherous stabbing of Tyler by the Mayor gave the signal for battle and massacre on the spot. The peasants closed in, roaring, They have killed our leader, when a strange thing happened something which gives us a fleeting and final glimpse of the crowned sacramental man of the Middle Ages. For one wild moment, divine right was divine. The king was no more than a boy. His very voice must have rung out to that multitude 
almost like the voice of a child. But the power of his fathers and the great Christendom from which he came fell in some strange fashion upon him, and riding out alone before the people, he cried out, I am your leader, and himself promised to grant them all they asked. That promise was afterwards broken, but those who see in the breach of it the mere fickleness of the young and frivolous king are not only shallow, but utterly ignorant interpreters of the whole trend of that time. The point that must be seized, if subsequent things are to be seen as they are, is that Parliament certainly encouraged and Parliament almost certainly obliged the king to repudiate the people. For when, after the rejoicing revolutionists had disarmed and were betrayed, the king urged a humane compromise on the Parliament, the Parliament furiously refused it. Already Parliament is not merely a governing body, but a governing class. Parliament was as contemptuous of the peasants in the 14th as of the Chartists in the 19th century. This council, first summoned by the king, like juries and many other things, to get from plain men rather reluctant evidence about taxation, has already become an object of ambition and is, therefore, an aristocracy. There is already war, in this case literally to the knife between the commons with the large C and the commons with the small one. Talking about the knife, it is notable that the murderer of Tyler was not a mere noble, but an elective magistrate of the mercantile oligarchy of London. Though there is probably no truth in the tale that his blood-stained dagger figures on the arms of the city of London. The medieval Londoners were quite capable of assassinating a man, but not of sticking so dirty a knife into the neighbourhood of the cross of their Redeemer. In the place which is really occupied by the sword of St. Paul. It is remarked above that Parliament was now an aristocracy, being an object of ambition. The truth is, perhaps, more subtle than this, but if ever men yearn to serve on juries, we may probably guess that juries are no longer popular. Anyhow, this must be kept in mind as against the opposite idea of the jus divinium, or fixed authority, if we would appreciate the fall of Richard. If the thing which dethroned him was a rebellion, it was a rebellion of the Parliament, of the thing that had just proved much more pitiless than he towards a rebellion of the people. But this is not the main point. The point is that by the removal of Richard, a step above the Parliament became possible for the first time. The transition was tremendous. The crown became an object of ambition. That which one could snatch, another could snatch from him. That which the House of Lancaster held merely by force, the House of York could take from it by force. The spell of an undethronable thing, seated out of reach, was broken, and for three unhappy generations adventurers strove and stumbled on a stairway slippery with blood, above which was something new in the medieval imagination, an empty throne. It is obvious that the insecurity of the Lancastrian usurper, largely because he was a usurper, is the clue to many things, some of which we should now call good, some bad, all of which we should probably call good or bad with the excessive facility with which we dismiss distant things. It led the Lancastrian House to lean on Parliament, which was the mixed matter we have already seen. It may have been in some ways good for the monarchy to be checked and challenged by an institution which at least kept something of the old freshness and freedom of speech. It was almost certainly bad for the Parliament, making it yet more the ally of the mere ambitious noble, of which we shall see much later. It also led the Lancastrian House to lean on patriotism, which was perhaps more popular to make English the tongue of the court for the first time, and to reopen the French wars with the fine flag-waving of Agincourt. It led it again to lean on the church, or rather, perhaps, on the higher clergy, and that in the least worthy aspect of clericalism. 
A certain morbidity which more and more darkened the end of medievalism showed itself in new and more careful cruelties against the last crop of heresies. A slight knowledge of the philosophy of these heresies will lend little support to the notion that they were in themselves prophetic of the Reformation. It is hard to see how anybody can call Wycliffe a Protestant unless he calls Pelagius or Arius a Protestant. And if John Ball was a reformer, Latimer was not a reformer. But though the new heresies did not even hint at the beginning of English Protestantism, they did perhaps hint at the end of English Catholicism. Cobham did not light a candle to be handed on to nonconformist chapels, but Arundel did light a torch, and put it to his own church. Such real unpopularity as did in time attach to the old religious system, and which afterwards became a true national tradition against Mary, was doubtless started by the diseased energy of these 15th century bishops. Persecution can be a philosophy, and a defensible philosophy, but with some of these men, persecution was rather a perversion. Across the channel, one of them was presiding at the trial of Joan of Arc. But this perversion, this diseased energy, is the power in all the epoch that follows the fall of Richard II, and especially in those views that found so ironic an imagery in English roses and thorns. The foreshortening of such a backward glance as this book can alone claim to be forbids any entrance into the military mazes of the wars of York and Lancaster, or any attempt to follow the thrilling recoveries and revenges which filled the lives of Warwick, the kingmaker, and the warlike widow of Henry V. The rivals were not, indeed, as is sometimes extravagantly implied, fighting for nothing, or even, like the lion and the unicorn, merely fighting for the crown. The shadow of a moral difference can still be traced even in that stormy twilight of a heroic time. But when we have said that Lancaster stood, on the whole, for the new notion of a king propped by parliaments and powerful bishops, and York, on the whole, for the remains of the older idea of a king who permits nothing to come between him and his people, we have said everything of permanent political interest that could be traced by counting all the bows of Barnet or all the lances of Tewkesbury. But this truth, that there was something which can only vaguely be called Tory about the Yorkists, has at least one interest, that it lends a justifiable romance to the last and most remarkable figure of the fighting house of York, with whose fall the Wars of the Roses ended. If we desire at all to catch the strange colours of the sunset of the Middle Ages, to see what had changed yet not wholly killed chivalry, there is no better study than the riddle of Richard III. Of course, scarcely a line of him was like the caricature with which his much meaner successor placarded the world when he was dead. He was not even a hunchback, He had one shoulder slightly higher than the other, probably the effect of his furious swordsmanship on a naturally slender and sensitive frame. Yet his soul, if not his body, haunts us somehow as the crooked shadow of a straight knight of better days. He was not an ogre, shedding rivers of blood. Some of the men he executed deserved it as much as any men of that wicked time and even the tale of his murdered nephews is not certain, and it is told by those who also tell us he was born with tusks and was originally covered with hair. Yet a crimson cloud cannot be dispelled from his memory, and so tainted is the very air of that time with carnage that we cannot say he was incapable even of the things of which he may have been innocent. Whether or no he was a good man, He was apparently a good king, and even a popular one. Yet we think of him vaguely, and not, I fancy, untruly, as on sufferance. He anticipated the Renaissance in an abnormal enthusiasm for art and music, 
and he seems to have held to the old paths of religion and charity. He did not pluck perpetually at his sword and dagger because his only pleasure was in cutting throats. He probably did it because he was nervous. It was the age of our first portrait painting, and a fine contemporary portrait of him throws a more plausible light on this particular detail. For it shows him touching, and probably twisting, a ring on his finger, the very act of a high-strung personality who would also fidget with a dagger. And in his face, as there painted, we can study all that has made it worthwhile to pore so long upon his name. An atmosphere very different from everything before and after. The face has a remarkable intellectual beauty, but there is something else on the face that is hardly in itself either good or evil, and that thing is death, the death of an epoch, the death of a great civilization, the death of something which once sang to the sun in the canticle of Saint Francis. And sailed to the ends of the earth in the ships of the first crusade, but which, in peace, wearied and turned its weapons inwards, wounded its own brethren, broke its own loyalties, gambled for the crown, and grew feverish even about the creed, and has this one grace among its dying virtues, that its valour is the last to die. But whatever else may have been bad or good about Richard of Gloucester, there was a touch about him which makes him truly the last of the medieval kings. It is expressed in one word which he cried aloud as he struck down foe after foe in the last charge at Bosworth: treason. For him, as for the first Norman kings, treason was the same as treachery, and in this case, at least, it was the same as treachery. When his nobles deserted him before the battle, he did not regard it as a new political combination, but as the sin of false friends and faithless servants. Using his own voice like the trumpet of a herald, he challenged his rival to a fight as personal as that of two paladins of Charlemagne. His rival did not reply and was not likely to reply. The modern world had begun. The call echoed unanswered down the ages, for since that day no English king has fought after that fashion. Having slain many, he was himself slain and his diminished force destroyed. So ended the war of the usurpers, and the last and most doubtful of all the usurpers, a wanderer from the Welsh marches, a knight from nowhere, found the crown of England under a bush of thorn. Eleven, the rebellion of the rich. Sir Thomas More, apart from any arguments about the more mystical meshes in which he was ultimately caught and killed, will be hailed by all as a hero of the new learning, that great dawn of a more rational daylight which, for so many, made medievalism seem a mere darkness. Whatever we think of his appreciation of the Reformation. There will be no dispute about his appreciation of the Renaissance. He was, above all things, a humanist and a very human one. He was even, in many ways, very modern, which some rather erroneously suppose to be the same as being human. He was also humane in the sense of humanitarian. He sketched an ideal, or rather, perhaps, a fanciful social system. With something of the ingenuity of Mr. H. G. Wells, but essentially with much more than the flippancy attributed to Mr. Bernard Shaw, it is not fair to charge the utopian notions upon his morality, but their subjects and suggestions mark what, for want of a better word, we can only call his modernism. Thus, the immortality of animals is the sort of transcendentalism which savours of evolution, and the grosser jest about the preliminaries of marriage might be taken quite seriously by the students of eugenics. He suggested a sort of pacifism, though the utopians had a quaint way of achieving it. In short, while he was with his friend Erasmus, a satirist of medieval abuses.
few would now deny that Protestantism would be too narrow rather than too broad for him. If he was obviously not a Protestant, there are few Protestants who would deny him the name of a reformer. But he was an innovator in things more alluring to modern minds than theology. He was partly what we should call a neo-pagan. His friend, Colette, summed up that escape from medievalism which might be called the passage from bad Latin to good Greek. In our loose modern debates, they are lumped together. But Greek learning was the growth of this time. There had always been a popular Latin, if a dog Latin. It would be nearer the truth to call the medievals bilingual than to call their Latin a dead language. Greek never, of course, became so general a possession. But for the man who got it, it is not too much to say that he felt as if he were in the open air for the first time. Much of this Greek spirit was reflected in more. Its universality, its urbanity, its balance of buoyant reason and cool curiosity. It is even probable that he shared some of the excesses and errors of taste which inevitably infected the splendid intellectualism of the reaction against the Middle Ages. We can imagine him thinking gargoyles gothic, in the sense of barbaric or even failing to be stirred, as Sidney was by the trumpet of Chevy Chase. The wealth of the ancient heathen world in wit, loveliness and civic heroism had so recently been revealed to that generation in its dazzling profusion and perfection that it might seem a trifle if they did here and there an injustice to the relics of the Dark Ages. When, therefore, we look at the world with the eyes of more, we are looking from the widest windows of that time looking over an English landscape seen for the first time very equally in the level of light of the sun at morning. For what he saw was England of the Renaissance, England passing from the medieval to the modern. Thus he looked forth and saw many things and said many things. They were all worthy and many witty. But he noted one thing which is at once a horrible fancy and a homely and practical fact. He, who looked over that landscape, said, Sheep are eating men. The singular summary of the great epoch of our emancipation and enlightenment is not the fact usually put first in such very curt historical accounts of it. It has nothing to do with the translation of the Bible or the character of Henry VIII, or the characters of Henry VIII's wives, or the triangular debates between Henry and Luther and the Pope. It was not popish sheep who were eating Protestant men, or vice versa, nor did Henry at any period of his own brief and rather bewildering papacy have martyrs eaten by lambs as the heathen had them eaten by lions. What was meant, of course, by this picturesque expression was that an intensive type of agriculture was giving way to a very extensive type of pasture. Great spaces of England, which had hitherto been cut up into the commonwealth of a number of farmers, were being laid under the sovereignty of a solitary shepherd. The point has been put, by a touch of epigram, rather in the manner of Moore himself, by Mr. J. Stephen, in a striking essay now, I think, only to be found in the back files of The New Witness. He enunciated the paradox that the very much admired individual, who made two blades of grass grow instead of one, was a murderer. In the same article, Mr. Stephen traced the true moral origins of this movement, which led to the growing of so much grass and the murder, or, at any rate, the destruction of so much humanity. He traced it, and every true record of that transformation traces it, to the growth of a new refinement, in a sense a more rational refinement, in the governing class. The medieval lord had been, by comparison, a coarse fellow. He had merely lived in the largest kind of farmhouse after the fashion of the largest kind of farmer. He drank wine when he could, but he was quite ready to drink ale, and science had not yet smoothed his paths with petrol. 
At a time later than this, one of the greatest ladies of England writes to her husband that she cannot come to him because her carriage horses are pulling the plough. In the true Middle Ages, the greatest men were even more rudely hampered, but in the time of Henry VIII, the transformation was beginning. In the next generation, a phrase was common which is one of the keys of the time, and is very much the key to these more ambitious territorial schemes. This or that great lord was said to be Italianti. It meant subtler shapes of beauty, delicate and ductile glass, gold and silver not treated as barbaric stones, but rather as stems and wreaths of molten metal, mirrors, cards and such trinkets bearing a load of beauty. It meant the perfection of trifles. It was not, as in popular Gothic craftsmanship, the almost unconscious touch of art upon all necessary things, rather it was the pouring of the whole soul of passionately conscious art, especially into unnecessary things. Luxury was made alive with the soul. We must remember this real thirst for beauty, for it is an explanation and an excuse. The old barony had indeed been thinned by the civil wars that closed at Bosworth and curtailed by the economical and crafty policy of that unkingly king, Henry VII. He was himself a new man, and we shall see the barons largely give place to a whole nobility of new men. But even the older families already had their faces set in the newer direction. Some of them, the Howards, for instance, may be said to have figured both as old and new families. In any case, the spirit of the whole upper class can be described as increasingly new. The English aristocracy, which is the chief creation of the Reformation, is undeniably entitled to a certain praise, which is now almost universally regarded as a very high praise. It was always progressive. Aristocrats are accused of being proud of their ancestors. It can truly be said that English aristocrats have rather been proud of their descendants. For their descendants, they planned huge foundations and piled mountains of wealth. For their descendants, they fought for a higher and higher place in the government of the state. For their descendants, above all, they nourished every new science or scheme of social philosophy. They seized the vast economic changes of pasturage but they also drained the fens. They swept away the priests, but they condescended to the philosophers. As the new Tudor house passes through its generations, a new and more rationalist civilization is being made. Scholars are criticizing authentic texts. Skeptics are discrediting not only popish saints, but pagan philosophers. Specialists are analyzing and rationalizing traditions and sheep are eating men. We have seen that in the 14th century in England there was a real revolution of the poor. It very nearly succeeded, and I need not conceal the conviction that it would have been the best possible thing for all of us if it had entirely succeeded. If Richard II had really sprung into the saddle of Wat Tyler, or rather if his parliament had not unhorsed him when he had got there, if he had confirmed the fact that the new peasant freedom, by some form of royal authority, as it was already common to confirm the fact of the trade unions by the form of a royal charter, our country would probably have had as happy a history as is possible to human nature. The Renaissance, when it came, would have come as popular education and not the culture of a club of ascetics. The new learning might have been as democratic as the old learning in the old days of medieval Paris and Oxford. The exquisite artistry of the school of Cellini might have been but the highest grade of the craft of a guild. The Shakespearean drama might have been acted by workmen on wooden stages set up in the street like Punch and Judy, the finer fulfilment of the miracle play as it was acted by a guild. The players need not have been the king's servants, but their own masters. The great Renaissance might have been liberal with its liberal education. 
If this be a fancy, it is at least one that cannot be disproved. The medieval revolution was too unsuccessful at the beginning for anyone to show that it need have been unsuccessful in the end. The feudal parliament prevailed and pushed back the peasants at least into their dubious and half-developed status. More than this, it would be exaggerative to say, and a mere anticipation of the really decisive events afterwards. When Henry VIII came to the throne, the guilds were perhaps checked, but apparently unchanged, and even the peasants had probably regained ground. Many were still theoretically serfs, but largely under the easy landlordism of the abbots. The medieval system still stood. It might, for all we know, have begun to grow again, but all such speculations are swamped in new and very strange things. The failure of the revolution of the poor was ultimately followed by a counter-revolution, a successful revolution of the rich. The apparent pivot of it was, in certain events, political and even personal. They roughly resolved themselves into two, the marriages of Henry VIII and the affair of the monasteries. The marriages of Henry VIII have long been a popular and even a stale joke, and there is a truth of tradition in the joke, as there is in almost any joke if it is sufficiently popular, and indeed if it is sufficiently stale. A jocular thing never lives to be stale unless it is also serious. Henry was popular in his first days, and even foreign contemporaries give us quite a glorious picture of a young prince of the Renaissance, radiant with all the new accomplishments. In his last days, he was something very like a maniac. He no longer inspired love, and even when he inspired fear, it was rather the fear of a mad dog than of a watchdog. In this change, doubtless the inconsistency and even ignominy of his bluebeard weddings played a great part, and it is but just to him to say that, perhaps with the exception of the first and the last, he was almost as unlucky in his wives as they were in their husband. But it was undoubtedly the affair of the first divorce that broke the back of his honour and incidentally broke a very large number of other more valuable and universal things. To feel the meaning of his fury, we must realise that he did not regard himself as the enemy, but rather as the friend of the Pope. There is a shadow of the old story of Becket. He had defended the Pope in diplomacy and the Church in controversy, and when he wearied of his queen, and took a passion fancy to one of her ladies, Anne Boleyn, he vaguely felt that a rather cynical concession, in that age of cynical concessions, might very well be made to him by a friend. But it is part of that high inconsistency which is the fate of the Christian faith in human hands, that no man knows when the higher side of it will really be uppermost if only for an instant, and that the worst ages of the church will not do or say something, as if by accident, that is worthy of the best. Anyhow, for whatever reason, Henry sought to lean upon the cushions of Leo, and found he had struck his arm upon the rock of Peter. The Pope denied the new marriage, and Henry, in a storm and darkness of anger, dissolved all old relations with the papacy. It is probable that he did not clearly know how much he was doing then, and it is very tenable that we do not know it now. He certainly did not think he was anti-Catholic, and, in one rather ridiculous sense, we can hardly say that he thought he was anti-papal, since he apparently thought he was a pope. From this day really dates something that played a certain part in history the more modern doctrine of the divine right of kings, widely different from the medieval one. It is a matter which further embarrasses the open question about the continuity of Catholic things in Anglicanism, for it was a new note and yet one struck by the older party. The supremacy of the king over the English national church was not, unfortunately, merely a fad of the king, but became partly and for one period, a fad of the church.
But apart from all controverted questions, there is at least a human and historic sense in which the continuity of our past is broken perilously at this point. Henry not only cut off England from Europe, but what was even more important, he cuts off England from England. The great divorce brought down Wolsey, the mighty minister who had held the scales between the empire and the French monarchy, and made the modern balance of power in Europe. He is often described under the dictum of Ego et Rex Maus, but he marks a stage in the history story rather because he suffered for it than because he said it. Ego et Rex Maus might be the motto of any modern prime minister for we have forgotten the very fact that the word minister merely means servant. Wolsey was the last great servant who could be, and was, simply dismissed. The mark of a monarchy still absolute. The English were amazed at it in modern Germany, when Bismarck was turned away like a butler. A more awful act proved the new force was already inhuman. It struck down the noblest of the humanists. Thomas More, who seemed sometimes like an Epicurean under Augustus, died the death of a saint under Diocletian. He died gloriously jesting, and the death has naturally drawn out for us rather the sacred saviours of his soul, his tenderness and his trust in the truth of God. But for humanism it must have seemed a monstrous sacrifice. It was somehow as if Montaigne were a martyr. And that is indeed the note. Something truly to be called unnatural had already entered the naturalism of the Renaissance, and the soul of the great Christian rose against it. He pointed to the sun, saying, I shall be above that fellow, with Franciscan familiarity, which can love nature because it will not worship her. So he left to his king the sun, which for so many weary days and years was to go down only on his wrath. But the more impersonal process which Moore himself had observed, as noted at the beginning of this chapter, is more clearly defined, and less clouded with controversies, in the second of the two parts of Henry's policy. There is indeed a controversy about the monasteries, but it is one that is clarifying and settling every day. Now, it is true that the Church, by the Renaissance period, had reached a considerable corruption. But the real proofs of it are utterly different both from the contemporary despotic pretense and from the common Protestant story. It is widely unfair, for instance, to quote the letters of bishops and such authorities denouncing the sins of monastic life, violent as they often are. They cannot be possibly more violent than the letters of St. Paul to the purest and most primitive churches. The Apostle was there writing to those early Christians whom all churches idolize, and he talks to them as to cut throats and thieves. The explanation for those concerned for such subtleties may possibly be found in the fact that Christianity is not a creed for good men, but for men. Such letters had been written in all centuries, and even in the 16th century they do not prove so much that there were bad abbots as that there were good bishops. Moreover, even those who profess that the monks were profligates dare not profess that they were oppressors. There is truth in Corbett's point that where monks were landlords, they did not become rack-renting landlords and could not become absentee landlords. Nevertheless, there was a weakness in the good institutions as well as a mere strength in the bad ones, and that weakness partakes of the worst element of the time. In the fall of good things, there is almost always a touch of betrayal from within, and the abbots were destroyed more easily because they did not stand together. They did not stand together because the spirit of the age, which is very often the worst enemy of the age, was the increasing division between rich and poor, and it had partly divided even the rich and poor clergy. And the betrayal came, as it nearly always comes, from that servant of Christ who holds the bag. 
to take a modern attack on liberty on a much lower plane, we are familiar with the picture of a politician going to the great brewers or even the great hotel proprietors and pointing out the uselessness of a litter of little public houses. That is what the Tudor politicians did first with the monasteries. They went to the heads of the great houses and proposed the extinction of the small ones. The great monastic lords did not resist, or at any rate did not resist enough, and the sack of the religious houses began. But if the lord abbots acted for a moment as lords, that could not excuse them in the eyes of much greater lords for having frequently acted as abbots. A momentary rally to the cause of the rich did not wipe out the disgrace of a thousand petty interferences which had told only to the advantage of the poor, and they were soon to learn that it was no epoch for their easy rule and their careless hospitality. The great houses, now isolated, were themselves brought down one by one, and the beggar, whom the monastery had served as a sort of sacred tavern, came to it at evening and found it a ruin. For a new and wide philosophy was in the world, which still rules our society. By this creed, most of the mystical virtues of the old monks have simply been turned into great sins, and the greatest of these is charity. But the populace which had risen under Richard II was not yet disarmed. It was trained in the rude discipline of bow and bill, and organised into local groups of town and guild and manor. Over half the counties of England the people rose, and fought one final battle for the vision of the Middle Ages. The chief tool of the new tyranny, a dirty fellow named Thomas Cromwell, was specially singled out as the tyrant, and he was indeed rapidly turning all government into a nightmare. The popular movement was put down partly by force, and there is the new note of modern militarism in the fact that it was put down by cynical professional troops actually brought in from foreign countries who destroyed English religion for hire. But, like the old popular rising, it was even more put down by fraud. Like the old rising, it was sufficiently triumphant to force the government to a parley, and the government had to resort to the simple expedient of calming the people with promises, and then proceeding to break first the promises and then the people, after the fashion made familiar to us by the modern politicians in their attitude towards the great strikes. The revolt bore the name of the Pilgrimage of Grace, and its programme was particularly the restoration of the old religion, in connection with the fancy about the fate of England if Tyler had triumphed, it proves, I think, one thing, that his triumph, while it might or might not have led to something that could be called a reform, would have rendered quite impossible everything that we now know as Reformation. The reign of terror established by Thomas Cromwell became an inquisition of the blackest and most unbearable sort. Historians who have no shadow of sympathy with the old religion are agreed that it was uprooted by means more horrible than have ever, perhaps, been employed in England before or since. It was a government by tortures, rendered ubiquitous by spies. The spoliation of the monasteries especially was carried out, not only with the violence which recalled barbarism, but with a minuteness for which there is no other word but meanness. It was as if the Dane had returned in the character of a detective. The inconsistency of the king's personal attitude to Catholicism did indeed complicate the conspiracy with the new brutalities towards Protestants. But such reaction as there was in this was wholly theological. Cromwell lost that fitful favour and was executed. But the terrorism went on the more terrible for being simplified to the single vision of the wrath of the king. It culminated in a strange act which rounds off symbolically the story told on an earlier page. For the despot revenged himself on a rebel whose defiance seemed to him to ring down three centuries. 
he laid waste the most popular shrine of the English, the shrine to which Chaucer had once ridden singing, because it was also the shrine where King Henry had knelt to repent. For three centuries the church and the people had called Becket a saint, when Henry Tudor arose and called him a traitor. This might well be thought the topmost point of autocracy, and yet it was not really so. For then rose to its supreme height of self-revelation that still stranger something of which we have, perhaps fancifully, found hints before in this history. The strong king was weak. He was immeasurably weaker than the strong kings of the Middle Ages, and whether or no his failure had been foreshadowed, he failed. The breach he had made in the dyke of the ancient doctrines let in a flood that may also be said to have washed him away. In a sense, he disappeared before he died, for the drama that filled his last days is no longer the drama of his own character. We may put the matter most practically by saying that it is unpractical to discuss whether Froude finds any justification for Henry's crimes in the desire to create a strong national monarchy. For whether or no it was desired, it was not created. Least of all our princes did the Tudors leave behind them a secure central government. And the time when monarchy was at its worst comes only one or two generations before the time when it was weakest. But a few years afterwards, as history goes, the relations of the crown and its new servants were to be reversed on a high stage so as to horrify the world. And the acts which had been sanctified with the blood of Moor and soiled with the blood of Cromwell was at the signal of one of that slave's own descendants, to fall and to kill an English king. The tide, which thus burst through the breach and overwhelmed the king as well as the church, was the revolt of the rich, and especially of the new rich. They used the king's name and could not have prevailed without his power, but the ultimate effect was rather as if they had plundered the king after he had plundered the monasteries. Amazingly little of the wealth, considering the name and theory of the thing, actually remained in royal hands. The chaos was increased, no doubt, by the fact that Edward VI succeeded to the throne as a mere boy, but the deeper truth can be seen in the difficulty of drawing any real line between the two reigns. By marrying into the Seymour family, and thus providing himself with a son, Henry had also provided the country with the very type of powerful family which was to rule merely by pillage. An enormous and unnatural tragedy, the execution of one of the Seymours by his own brother, was enacted during the impotence of the childish king, and the successful Seymour figured as Lord Proctor though even he would have found it hard to say what he was protecting, since it was not even his own family. Anyhow, it is hardly too much to say that every human thing was left unprotected from the greed of such cannibal protectors. We talk of the dissolution of the monasteries, but what occurred was the dissolution of the whole of the old civilization. Lawyers and lackeys and moneylenders The meanest of lucky men looted the art and economies of the Middle Ages like thieves robbing a church. Their names, when they did not change them, became the names of the great dukes and marquises of our own day. But if we look back and forth in our own history, perhaps the most fundamental act of destruction occurred when the armed men of the Seymours and their sort passed from the sacking of the monasteries to the sacking of the guilds. The medieval trade unions were struck down, their buildings broken into by the soldiery, and their funds seized by the new nobility. And this simple incident takes all its common meaning out of the assertion, in itself plausible enough, that the guilds, like everything else at that time, were probably not at their best. Proportion is the only practical thing, and it may be true that Caesar was not feeling well on the morning of the Ides of March. But simply to say that the guilds declined 
is about as true as saying that Caesar quietly decayed from purely natural causes at the foot of the statue of Pompey. 12. Spain and the Schisms of Nations The revolution that arose out of what is called the Renaissance and ended in some countries in what is called the Reformation did in the internal politics of England one drastic and definite thing. That thing was destroying the institutions of the poor. It was not the only thing it did, but it was much the most practical. It was the basis of all the problems now connected with capital and labour. How much the theological theories of the time had to do with it is a perfectly fair matter for difference of opinion. But neither party, if educated about the facts, will deny that the same time and temper which produced the religious schism also produced this new lawlessness in the rich. The most extreme Protestant will probably be content to say that Protestantism was not the motive but the mask. The most extreme Catholic will probably be content to admit that Protestantism was not the sin but rather the punishment. The most sweeping and shameless part of the process was not complete, indeed, until the end of the 18th century, when Protestantism was already passing into scepticism. Indeed, a very decent case could be made out for the paradox that Puritism was first and last a veneer of paganism that the thing began in the inordinate thirst for new things in the noblesse of the Renaissance and ended in the Hellfire Club. Anyhow, what was first founded at the Reformation was a new and abnormally powerful aristocracy, and what was destroyed, in an ever-increasing degree, was everything that could be held, directly or indirectly, by the people, in spite of such an aristocracy. This fact has filled all the subsequent history of our country, but the next particular point in that history concerns the position of the crown. The king, in reality, had already been elbowed aside by the courtiers who had crowded behind him just before the bursting of the door. The king is left behind in the rush for wealth and already can do nothing alone. And of this fact, the next reign, after the chaos of Edward VI, affords a very arresting proof. Mary Tudor, daughter of the divorced Queen Catherine, has a bad name even in popular history. And popular prejudice is generally more worthy of study than scholarly sophistry. Her enemies were indeed largely wrong about her character, but they were not wrong about her effect. She was, in the limited sense, a good woman, convinced, conscientious, rather morbid. But it is true that she was a bad queen, bad for many things, but especially bad for her own most beloved cause. It is true, when all is said, that she set herself to burn out no popery, and managed to burn it in. The concentration of her fanaticism into cruelty, especially its concentration in particular places and in a short time, did remain like something red-hot in the public memory. It was the first of the series of great historical accidents that separated a real, if not universal, public opinion from the old regime. It has been summarised in the death by fire of the three famous martyrs at Oxford, for one of them at least, Latimer, was a reformer of the more robust and human type, though another of them, Cranmer, had been so smooth a snob and cowered in the councils of Henry VIII as to make Thomas Cromwell seem, by comparison, a man. But of what may be called the Latimer tradition, the saner and more genuine Protestantism I shall speak later. At the time, even the Oxford martyrs probably produced less pity and revulsion than the massacre in the flames of many more obscure enthusiasts, whose very ignorance and poverty made their cause seem more popular than it really was.
but this last ugly feature was brought into sharper relief and produced more conscience or unconscious bitterness because of that other great fact of which I spoke above, which is the determining test of this time of transition. What made all the difference was this, that even in this Catholic reign, the property of the Catholic Church could not be restored. The very fact that Mary was a fanatic, and yet this act of justice was beyond the wildest dreams of fanaticism, that is the point. The very fact that she was angry enough to commit wrongs for the Church, and yet not bold enough to ask for the rights of the Church, that is the test of the time. She was allowed to deprive small men of their lives, she was not allowed to deprive great men of their property, or rather of other people's property. She could punish heresy, she could not punish sacrilege. She was forced into the false position of killing men who had not gone to church and sparing men who had gone there to steal the church ornaments. What forced her into it? Not certainly her own religious attitude, which was almost maniacally sincere, not public opinion, which had naturally much more sympathy for the religious humanities which she did not restore than for the religious inhumanities which she did. The force came, of course, from the new nobility and the new wealth they refused to surrender, and the success of this early pressure proves that the nobility was already stronger than the crown. The scepter had only been used as a crowbar to break open the door of a treasure house, and was itself broken, or at least bent, with the blow. There is a truth also in the popular insistence on the story of Mary having Calais written on her heart, when the last relic of the medieval conquests reverted to France. Mary had the solitary and heroic half-virtue of the Tudors. She was a patriot. But patriots are often pathetically behind the times, for the very fact that they dwell on old enemies often blinds them to new ones. In a later generation, Cromwell exhibited the same error reversed and continued to keep a hostile eye on Spain when he should have kept it on France. In our own time, the Jingos of Fashoda kept it on France when they ought already to have had it on Germany. With no particular anti-national intention, Mary nevertheless got herself into an anti-national position towards the most tremendous international problem of her people. It is the second of the coincidences that confirmed the 16th century change, and the name of it was Spain. The daughter of a Spanish queen, she married a Spanish prince, and probably saw no more in such an alliance than her father had done. But by the time she was succeeded by her sister Elizabeth, who was more cut off from the old religion, though very tenuously attached to the new one, and by the time the project of a similar Spanish marriage for Elizabeth herself had fallen through, something had matured which was wider and mightier than the plots of princes. The Englishman, standing on his little island as on a lonely boat, had already felt falling across him the shadow of a tall ship. Wooden clichés about the birth of the British Empire and the spacious days of Queen Elizabeth have not merely obscured but contradicted the crucial truth. From such phrases one would fancy that England, in some imperial fashion, now first realised that she was great. It would be far truer to say that she now first realised that she was small. The great poet of the spacious days does not praise her as spacious, but only as small, like a jewel. The vision of universal expansion was wholly veiled until the 18th century, and even when it came it was far less vivid and vital than what came in the 16th. What came then was not imperialism, it was anti-imperialism. England achieved at the beginning of her modern history that one thing human imagination will always find heroic, the story of a small nationality. The business of the Armada was to her what Bannockburn was to the Scots. 
or Majuba to the Boers, a victory that astonished even the victors. What was opposed to them was imperialism in its complete and colossal sense, a thing unthinkable since Rome. It was, in no overstrained sense, civilization itself. It was the greatness of Spain that was the glory of England. It is only when we realize that the English were, by comparison, as dingy, as undeveloped, as petty and provincial as Boers, that we can appreciate the height of their defiance or the splendor of their escape. We can only grasp it by grasping that for a great part of Europe the cause of the Armada had almost the cosmopolitan common sense of a crusade. The Pope had declared Elizabeth illegitimate. Logically, it is hard to see what else he could say, having declared her mother's marriage invalid. But the fact was another and perhaps a final stroke surrendering England from the elder world. Meanwhile, those picturesque English privateers who had plagued the Spanish Empire of the New World were spoken of in the South simply as pirates, and technically the description was true. Only technical assaults by the weaker party are, in retrospect, rightly judged with some generous weakness. Then, as if to stamp the contrast in an impressionable image, Spain or rather the empire, with Spain for its centre, put forth all its strength and seemed to cover the sea with a navy like the legendary navy of Xerxes. It bore down on the doomed island with the weight and solemnity of a day of judgment. Sailors or pirates struck at it with small ships staggering under large cannon, fought it with mere masses of flaming rubbish, and in that last hour of grapple a great storm arose out of the sea and swept round the island, and the gigantic fleet was seen no more. The uncanny completeness and abrupt silence that swallowed this prodigy touched a nerve that has never ceased to vibrate. The hope of England dates from that hopeless hour, for there is no real hope that has not once been a forlorn hope. The breaking of that vast naval net remained like a sign that the small thing which escaped would survive the greatness. And yet there is truly a sense in which we may never be so small or so great again. For the splendour of the Elizabethan age, which is always spoken of as a sunrise, was in many ways a sunset. Whether we regard it as the end of the Renaissance or the end of the old medieval civilization, no candid critic can deny that its chief glories ended with it. Let the reader ask himself what strikes him specially in the Elizabethan magnificence, and he will generally find it is something of which there were at least traces in medieval times, and far fewer traces in modern times. The Elizabethan drama is like one of its own tragedies, its tempestuous torch was soon to be trodden out by the Puritans. It is needless to say that the chief tragedy was the cutting short of the comedy, for the comedy that came to England after the Restoration was by comparison both foreign and frigid. At the best, it is comedy in the sense of being humorous, but not in the sense of being happy. It may be noted that the givers of good news and good luck in the Shakespearean love stories nearly all belong to a world which was passing, whether they are friars or fairies. It is the same with the chief Elizabethan ideals, often embodied in the Elizabethan drama. The national devotion to the Virgin Queen must not be wholly discredited by its incongruity with the coarse and crafty character of the historical Elizabeth. Her critics might indeed reasonably say that in replacing the Virgin Mary by the Virgin Queen, the English reformers merely exchanged a true virgin for a false one. But this truth does not dispose of a true, though limited, contemporary cult. Whatever we think of that particular Virgin Queen, the tragic heroines of the time offer us a whole procession of Virgin Queens, and it is certain that the medievals would have understood much better than the moderns 
the martyrdom of Measure for Measure, and as with the title of Virgin, so with the title of Queen. The mystical monarchy glorified in Richard II was soon to be dethroned much more ruinously than in Richard II. The same Puritans who tore off the pasteboard crowns of the stage players were also to tear off the real crowns of the kings whose parts they played. All mummery was to be forbidden, and all monarchy to be called mummery. Shakespeare died upon St. George's Day, and much of what St. George had meant died with him. I do not mean that the patriotism of Shakespeare or of England died, that remained and even rose steadily, to be the noblest pride of the coming times. But much more than patriotism had been involved in that image of St. George, to whom the Lionheart had dedicated England long ago in the deserts of Palestine. The conception of a patron saint had carried from the Middle Ages one very unique and as yet unreplaced idea. It was the idea of variation without antagonism. The seven champions of Christendom were multiplied by seventy times seven in the patrons of towns, trades and social types, but the very idea that they were all saints excluded the possibility of ultimate rivalry in the fact that they were all patrons. The guild of the shoemakers and the guild of the skinners carrying the badges of St. Crispin and St. Bartholomew, might fight each other in the streets, but they did not believe that St. Crispin and St. Bartholomew were fighting each other in the skies. Similarly, the English would cry in battle on St. George and the French on St. Denis. But they did not seriously believe that St. George hated St. Denis or even those who cried upon St. Denis. Joan of Arc, who was on the point of patronism, what many modern people would call very fanatical, was yet upon this point what most modern people would call very enlightened. Now, with the religious schism, it cannot be denied, a deeper and more inhuman division appeared. It was no longer a scrap between the followers of saints who were themselves at peace, but a war between the followers of gods who were themselves at war. That the great Spanish ships were named after St. Francis or St. Philip was already beginning to mean little to the New England. Soon it was to mean something almost cosmically conflicting, as if they were named after Baal or Thor. These are indeed mere symbols, but the process of which they are symbols was very practical and must be seriously followed. There entered with the religious wars the idea which modern science applies to racial wars, the idea of natural wars, not arising from a special quarrel, but from the nature of the people quarrelling. The shadow of racial fatalism first fell across our path, and far away in distance and darkness something moved that men had almost forgotten. Beyond the frontiers of the fading empire lay that outer land, as loose and drifting as a sea, which had boiled over in the barbarian wars. Most of it was now formerly Christian, but barely civilised. A faint awe of the culture of the south and west lay on its wild forces like a light frost. This semi-civilised world had long been asleep, but it had begun to dream. In the generation before Elizabeth, a great man who, with all his violence, was vitally a dreamer, Martin Luther, had cried out in his sleep in a voice like thunder, partly against the place of bad customs, but largely also against the place of good works in the Christian scheme. In the generation after Elizabeth, the spread of the new wild doctrines in the old wild lands had sucked Central Europe into a cyclic war of creeds. In this, the house which stood for the legend of the Holy Roman Empire, Austria, the Germanic partner of Spain, fought for the old religion against a league of other Germans fighting for the new. 
the continental conditions were indeed complicated and grew more and more complicated as the dream of restoring religious unity receded. They were complicated by the firm determination of France to be a nation in the full modern sense, to stand free and foursquare from all combinations, a purpose which led her, while hating her own Protestants at home, to give diplomatic support to many Protestants abroad, simply because it preserved the balance of power against the gigantic confederation of Spaniards and Austrians. It is complicated by the rise of the Calvinistic and commercial power in the Netherlands, logical, defiant, defending its own independence valiantly against Spain. But on the whole, we shall be right if we see the first throes of the modern international problems in what is called the Thirty Years' War, whether we call it the revolt of the half-heathens against the Holy Roman Empire, or whether we call it the coming of new sciences, new philosophies and new ethics from the North. Sweden took a hand in the struggle and sent a military hero to the help of the newer Germany. But the sort of military heroism everywhere exhibited offered a strange combination of more and more complex strategic science with the most naked and cannibal cruelty. Other forces besides Sweden found a career in the carnage. Far away to the northeast, in a sterile land of fens, a small, ambitious family of moneylenders who had become squires, vigilant, thrifty, thoroughly selfish, rather thinly adopted the theories of Luther and began to lend their almost savage hinds as soldiers on the Protestant side. They were well paid for it by step after step of promotion, but at this time their principality was only the old mark of Brandenburg. Their own name was Hohenzollern. Thirteen. The Age of the Puritans We should be very much bored if we had to read an account of the most exciting argument or string of adventures in which unmeaning words such as snark or boojum were systematically substituted for the names of the chief characters or objects in dispute. If we were told that a king was given the alternative of becoming a snark or finally surrendering the boojum, or that a mob was roused to fury by the public exhibition of a boojum, which was inevitably regarded as a gross reflection on the snark. Yet something very like this situation is created by most modern attempts to tell the tale of the theological troubles of the 16th and 17th centuries, while deferring to the fashionable distastes for theology in this generation, or rather, in the last generation. Thus, the Puritans, as their name implies, were primarily enthusiastic for what they thought was pure religion. Frequently, they wanted to impose it on others. Sometimes they only wanted to be free to practice it themselves. But in no case can justice be done to what was finest in their characters, as well as first in their thoughts if we never, by any chance, ask what it was they wanted to impose or to practice. Now, there was a great deal that was very fine about many of the Puritans, which is almost entirely missed by the modern admirers of the Puritans. They are praised for things which they either regarded with indifference or more often detested with frenzy, such as religious liberty and yet they are quite insufficiently understood and are even undervalued in their logical case for the things they really did care about, such as Calvinism. We make the Puritans picturesque in a way they would violently repudiate, in novels and plays they would have publicly burnt. We are interested in everything about them, except the only thing in which they were interested at all. We have seen that in the first instance, the new doctrines in England were simply an excuse for plutocratic pillage, and that is the only truth to be told about the matter. 
but it was far otherwise with the individuals a generation or two after, to whom the wreck of the Amada was already a legend of national deliverance from popery, as miraculous and almost as remote as the deliverances of which they read so realistically in the Hebrew books now laid open to them. The August accident of that Spanish defeat may perhaps have coincided only too well with their concentration on the non-Christian parts of Scripture. It may have satisfied a certain Old Testament sentiment of the election of the English being announced in the stormy oracles of air and sea, which was easily turned into that heresy of a tribal pride that took even heavier hold upon the Germans. It is by such things that a civilized state may fall from being a Christian nation to being a chosen people. But even if their nationalism was of a kind that has ultimately proved perilous to the comity of nations, it still was nationalism. From first to last, the Puritans were patriots, a point in which they had a marked superiority over the French Huguenots, Politically, they were indeed at first but one wing of the new wealthy class which had despoiled the church and were proceeding to despoil the crown. But while they were all merely the creatures of the great spoliation, many of them were the unconscious creatures of it. They were strongly represented in the aristocracy, but a great number were of the middle classes, though almost wholly of the middle classes of the towns. By the poor agricultural population, which was still by far the largest part of the population, they were simply derided and detested. It may be noted, for instance, that while they led the nation in many of its higher departments, they could produce nothing having the atmosphere of what is rather priggishly called folklore. All the popular tradition there is, as in songs, toasts, rhymes or proverbs, is all royalist. About the Puritans we can find no great legend. We must put up as best we can with great literature. All these things, however, are simply things that other people might have noticed about them. They are not the most important things, and certainly not the things they thought about themselves. The soul of the movement was in two conceptions, or rather in two steps the first being the moral process by which they arrived at their chief conclusion, and the second, the chief conclusion they arrived at. We will begin with the first, especially as it was this which determined all that external social attitude which struck the eye of contemporaries. The honest Puritan, growing up in youth in a world swept bare by the great pillage, possessed himself of a first principle which is one of the three or four alternative first principles which are possible to the mind of man. It was the principle that the mind of man can alone directly deal with the mind of God. It may shortly be called the anti-sacramental principle, but it really applies, and he really applied it to many things besides the sacraments of the church. It equally applies, and he equally applied it to art, to letters, to the love of locality, to music, and even to good manners. The phrase about no priest coming between man and his creator is but an impoverished fragment of the full philosophical doctrine. The true Puritan was equally clear that no singer or storyteller or fiddler must translate the voice of God to him into the tongues of terrestrial beauty. It is notable that the one Puritan man of genius in modern times, Tolstoy, did accept this full conclusion, denounced all music as a mere drug and forbade his own admirers to read his own admirable novels. Now, the English Puritans were not only Puritans, but Englishmen, and therefore did not always shine in clearness of head. As we shall see, true Puritism was rather a Scotch than an English thing. But this was the driving power and the direction.
and the doctrine is quite tenable if a trifle insane. Intellectual truth was the only tribute fit for the highest truth of the universe, and the next step in such a study is to observe what the Puritan thought was the truth about that truth. His individual reason, cut loose from instinct as well as tradition, taught him a concept of the omnipotence of God, which meant simply the impotence of man. In Luther, the earlier and milder form of the Protestant process only went so far as to say that nothing a man did could help him except his confession of Christ. With Calvin, it took the last logical step and said that even this could not help him, since omnipotence must have disposed of all his destiny beforehand, that men must be created to be lost and saved. In the purer types of whom I speak, this logic was white-hot, and we must read the formula into all their parliamentary and legal formulae. When we read the Puritan party demanded reforms in the church, we must understand the Puritan party demanded fuller and clearer affirmation that men are created to be lost and saved. When we read the army selected persons for their godliness, we must understand the army selected those persons who seemed most convinced that men are created to be lost and saved. It should be added that this terrible trend was not confined even to Protestant countries. Some great Romanists doubtfully followed it until stopped by Rome. It was the spirit of the age and should be a permanent warning against mistaking the spirit of the age for the immortal spirit of man. For there are now few Christians or non-Christians who can look back at the Calvinism which nearly captured Canterbury and even Rome by the genius and heroism of Pascal or Milton without crying out, like the lady in Mr. Bernard Shaw's play, how splendid, how glorious, and oh, what an escape! The next thing to note is that their conception of church government was in a true sense self-government and yet, for a particular reason, turned out to be a rather selfish self-government. It was equal, and yet it was exclusive. Internally, the synod or conventicle tended to be a small republic, but unfortunately to be a very small republic. In relation to the street outside the conventicle was not a republic, but an aristocracy. It was the most awful of all aristocracies, that of the elect, for it was not a right of birth, but a right before birth, and alone of all nobilities it was not laid level in the dust. Hence we have, on the one hand, in the simpler Puritans, a ring of real republican virtue, a defiance of tyrants, an assertion of human dignity, but above all an appeal to that first of all republican virtues, publicity. One of the regicides, on trial for his life, struck the note which all the unnaturalness of his school cannot deprive of nobility. This thing was not done in a corner, but their most drastic idealism did nothing to recover a ray of the light that at once lightened every man that came into the world, the assumption of a brotherhood in all baptized people. They were, indeed, very like that dreadful scaffold at which the regicide was not afraid to point. They were certainly public. They may have been public-spirited. They were never popular, and it seems never to have crossed their minds that there was any need to be popular. England was never so little of a democracy as during the short time when she was a republic. The struggle with the Stuarts, which is the next passage in our history, arose from an alliance, which some may think an accidental alliance, between two things. The first was this intellectual fashion of Calvinism, 
which affected the cultured world, as did our recent intellectual fashion of collectivism. The second was the older thing which had made that creed and perhaps that cultured world possible, the aristocratic revolt under the last Tudors. It was, we might say, the story of a father and a son dragging down the same golden image, but the younger really from hatred of idolatry, and the older solely from love of gold. It is at once the tragedy and the paradox of England that it was the eternal passion that passed, and the transient or terrestrial passion that remained. This was true of England. It was far less true of Scotland. And that is the meaning of the Scotch and English war that ended at Worcester. The first change had indeed been much the same materialist matter in both countries, a mere brigandage of barons. And even John Knox, though he has become a national hero, was an extremely anti-national politician. The Patriot Party in Scotland was that of Cardinal Beaton and Mary Stuart. Nevertheless, the new creed did become popular in the lowlands in a positive sense, not even yet known in our own land. Hence, in Scotland, Puritism was the main thing, and was mixed with parliamentary and other oligarchies. In England, parliamentary oligarchy was the main thing, and was mixed with Puritism. When the storm began to rise against Charles I, after the more or less transitional time of his father, the Scotch successor of Elizabeth, the instances commonly cited mark all the difference between democratic religion and aristocratic politics. The Scotch legend is that of Jenny Geddes, the poor woman who threw a stool at the priest. The English legend is that of John Hampden, the great squire who raised a county against the king. The parliamentary movement in England was, indeed, almost wholly a thing of squires, with their new allies, the merchants. They were squires who may well have regarded themselves as the real and natural leaders of the English, but they were leaders who allowed no mutiny among their followers. There was certainly no village Hampden in Hampden village. The Stuarts, it may be suspected, brought from Scotland a more medieval and therefore more logical view of their own function. For the note of their nation was logic. It is a proverb that James I was a Scot and a pedant, it is hardly sufficiently noted that Charles I also was not a little of a pedant, being very much of a Scot. He had also the virtues of a Scot, courage and a quite natural dignity and an appetite for the things of the mind. Being somewhat Scottish, he was very un-English and could not manage a compromise. He tried instead to split hairs and seemed merely to break promises yet he might safely have been far more inconsistent if he had been a little hearty and hazy, but he was of the sort that sees everything in black and white, and it is therefore remembered, especially the black. From the first he fenced with his parliament as if with a mere foe. Perhaps he almost felt it was a foreigner, the issue is familiar, and we need not be so careful as the gentleman who wished to finish the chapter in order to find out what happened to Charles I. His minister, the great Strafford, was foiled in an attempt to make him strong in the fashion of a French king, and perished on the scaffold a frustrated Richelieu. The Parliament claiming the power of the purse, Charles appealed to the power of the sword and at first carried all before him, but success passed to the wealth of the parliamentary class, the discipline of the new army, and the patience and genius of Cromwell, and Charles died the same death as his great servant. Historically, the quarrel resolved itself through ramifications generally followed perhaps in more detail than they deserve into the great modern query of whether a king can raise taxes without the consent of his parliament. 
The test case was that of Hamden, the great Buckinghamshire magnate, who challenged the legality of a tax which Charles imposed, professedly for a national navy. As even innovators always of necessity seek for sanctity in the past, the Puritan squires made a legend of the medieval Magna Carta, and they were so far in a true tradition that the concession of John had really been, as we have already noted, anti-despotic without being democratic. These two truths cover two parts of the problem of the Stuart Fall, which are of very different certainty and should be considered separately. For the first point about democracy, no candid person, in face of the facts, can really consider it at all. It is quite possible to hold that the 17th century Parliament was fighting for the truth. It is not possible to hold that it was fighting for the populace. After the autumn of the Middle Ages, Parliament was always actively aristocratic and actively anti-popular. The institution which forbade Charles I to raise ship money was the same institution which previously forbade Richard II to free the serfs. The group which claimed coal and minerals from Charles I was the same which afterwards claimed the common lands from the village communities. It was the same institution which only two generations before had eagerly helped to destroy, not merely things of popular sentiment like the monasteries, but all the things of popular utility like the guilds and parishes, the local governments of towns and trades. The work of the great lords may have had, indeed it certainly had, another more patriotic and creative side. But it was exclusively the work of the great lords that was done by Parliament. The House of Commons has itself been a House of Lords. But when we turn to the other or anti-despotic aspects of the campaign against the Stuarts, we come to something much more difficult to dismiss and much more easy to justify. While the stupidest things are said against the Stuarts, the real contemporary case for their enemies is little realised, for it is connected with what our insular history most neglects, the condition of the continent. It should be remembered that though the Stuarts failed in England, they fought for things that succeeded in Europe. These were roughly, first, the effects of the Counter-Reformation, which made the sincere Protestant see Stuart Catholicism not at all as the last flicker of an old flame, but as the spread of a conflagration. Charles II, for instance, was a man of strong, sceptical, and almost irritably humorous intellect, and he was quite certainly and even reluctantly convinced of Catholicism as a philosophy. The other and more important matter here was the almost awful autocracy that was being built up in France like a Bastille. It was more logical and in many ways more equal and even equitable than the English oligarchy but it really became a tyranny in case of rebellion or even resistance. There were none of the rough English safeguards of juries and good customs of the old common law. There was lettre de cachet, as unanswerable as magic. The English who defied the law were better off than the French. A French satirist would probably have retorted that it was the English who obeyed the law who were worse off than the French. The ordering of men's normal lives was with the squire, but he was, if anything, more limited when he was the magistrate. He was stronger as master of the village, but actually weaker as agent of the king. In defending this state of things, in short, the Whigs were certainly not defending democracy, but they were, in a real sense, defending liberty. They were even defending some remains of medieval liberty, though not the best. The jury, though, not the guild. Even the feudalism had involved a localism 
not without liberal elements, which lingered in the aristocratic system. Those who loved such things might well be alarmed at the Leviathan of the state, which for Hobbes was a single monster and for France a single man. As to the mere facts, it must be said again that in so far as Puritism was pure, it was unfortunately passing, and the very type of the transition by which it passed can be found in that extraordinary man who is popularly credited with making it predominant. Oliver Cromwell is in history much less the leader of Puritism than the tamer of Puritism. He was undoubtedly possessed, certainly in his youth, possibly all his life, by the rather sombre religious passions of his period. But as he emerges into importance, he stands more and more for the positivism of the English as compared with the Puritanism of the Scotch. He is one of the Puritan squires, but he is steadily more of the squire and less of the Puritan and he points to the process by which the squirearchy became at last merely pagan. This is the key to most of what is praised and most of what is blamed in him, the key to the comparative sanity, toleration and modern efficiency of many of his departures, the key to the comparative coarseness, earthiness, cynicism and lack of sympathy in many others. He was the reverse of an idealist, and he cannot, without absurdity, be held up as an ideal. But he was, like most of the squires, a type of genuinely English, not without public spirit, certainly not without patriotism. His seizure of personal power, which destroyed an impersonal and ideal government, had something English in its very unreason. The act of killing the king, I fancy, was not primarily his and certainly not characteristically his. It was a concession to the high inhuman ideals of the tiny group of true Puritans, with whom he had to compromise but with whom he afterwards collided. It was logic rather than cruelty in the act that was not Cromwellian for he treated with brutal cruelty the native Irish, whom the new spiritual exclusiveness regarded as beasts, or, as the modern euphemism would put it, as aborigines. But this practical temper was more akin to such human slaughter on what seemed to him the edges of civilization than to a sort of human sacrifice in the very centre and forum of it. He is not a representative regicide. In a sense, that piece of headmanship was rather above his head. The real regicides did it in a sort of trance or vision, and he was not troubled with visions. But the true collision between the religious and rational sides of the 17th century movement came symbolically on that day of driving storm in Dunbar when the raving Scotch preachers overruled Leslie and forced him down into the valley to be the victim of the Cromwellian common sense. Cromwell said that God had delivered them into his hand, but it was their own God who delivered them, the dark, unnatural God of the Calvinist dreams, as overpowering as a nightmare and as passing. It was the Whig rather than the Puritan that triumphed on that day, It was the Englishman with his aristocratic compromise, and even what followed Cromwell's death, the Restoration, was an aristocratic compromise and even a Whig compromise. The mob might cheer as for a medieval king, but the Protectorate and the Restoration were more of a peace than the mob understood. Even in the superficial things where there seemed to be a rescue, it was ultimately a respite. Thus, the Puritan regime had risen chiefly by one thing unknown to medievalism, militarism. Pickford professional troops, harshly drilled but highly paid, were the new and alien instrument by which the Puritans became masters. 
These were disbanded and their return resisted by Tories and Whigs. But their return seemed always imminent, because it was in the spirit of the new stern world of the Thirty Years' War. A discovery is an incurable disease, and it had been discovered that a crowd could be turned into an iron centipede, crushing larger and looser crowds. Similarly, the remains of Christmas were rescued from the Puritans, but they had eventually to be rescued again by Dickens from the Utilitarians, and may yet have to be rescued by somebody from the Vegetarians and Teetotalers. The strange army passed and vanished almost like a Muslim invasion, but it had made the difference that armed valour and victory always make, if it was but a negative difference. It was the final break in our history. It was a breaker of many things, and perhaps of popular rebellion in our land. It is something of a verbal symbol that these men founded New England in America, for indeed, they tried to found it here. By a paradox, there was something prehistoric in the very nakedness of their novelty. Even the old and savage things they invoked became more savage in becoming more new. In observing what is called their Jewish Sabbath, they would have had to stone the strictest Jew, and they, and indeed their age generally, turned witch-burning from an episode to an epidemic. The destroyers and the things destroyed disappeared together. But they remain as something nobler than the nibbling legalism of some of the Whig cynics who continued their work. They were, above all things, anti-historic, like the futurists in Italy, and there was the unconscious greatness about them that their very sacrilege was public and solemn like a sacrament and they were ritualists, even as iconoclasts. It was, properly considered, but a very secondary example of their strange and violent simplicity, that one of them, before a mighty mob at Whitehall, cut off the anointed head of the sacramental man of the Middle Ages. For another, far away in the western shires, cut down the thorn of Glastonbury, from which had grown the whole story of Britain. 14. The Triumph of the Whigs Whether or no we believe that the Reformation really reformed, there can be little doubt that the Restoration did not really restore. Charles II was never in the old sense a king, he was a leader of the opposition to his own ministers. Because he was a clever politician, he kept his official post. But because his brother and successor was an incredibly stupid politician, he lost it. But the throne was already one of the official posts. In some ways, indeed, Charles II was fitted for the more modern world then beginning. He was rather an 18th century than a 17th century man. He was as witty as a character in a comedy, and it was already the comedy of Sheridan and not of Shakespeare. He was more modern yet when he enjoyed the pure experimentalism of the Royal Society, and bent eagerly over the toys that were to grow into the terrible engines of science. He and his brother, however, had two links with what was in England the losing side, and by the strain on these their dynastic cause was lost. The first, which lessened in its practical pressure as time passed, was, of course, the hatred felt for their religion. The second, which grew as it neared the next century, was their tie with the French monarchy. We will deal with the religious quarrel before passing on to a much more irreligious age but the truth about it is tangled and far from easy to trace. The Tudors had begun to persecute the old religion before they had ceased to belong to it. That is one of the transitional complexities that can only be conveyed by such contradictions. A person of the type and time of Elizabeth would feel fundamentally and even fiercely that priests should be celibate, 
while racking and rending anybody caught talking to the only celibate priest. The mystery, which may be very variously explained, covered the Church of England, and in a great degree the people of England. Whether it be called the Catholic continuity of Anglicanism, or merely the slow extirpation of Catholicism, there can be no doubt that a parson like Herrick, for instance, as late as the Civil War, was stuffed with superstitions, which were Catholic in the extreme sense we should now call continental. Yet many similar parsons had already a parallel and opposite passion, and thought of continental Catholicism not even as the errant Church of Christ, but as the consistent Church of Antichrist. It is, therefore, very hard now to guess the proportion of Protestantism, but there is no doubt about its presence, especially its presence in centres of importance like London. By the time of Charles II, after the purge of the Puritan terror, it had become something at least more inherent and human than the mere exclusiveness of Calvinist creeds or the craft of Tudor nobles. The Monmouth Rebellion showed that it had a popular, though an insufficiently popular, backing. The no-popery force became the crowd if it never became the people. It was, perhaps, increasingly an urban crowd and was subject to those epidemics of detailed delusion with which sensational journalism plays on the urban crowds of today. One of these scares and scoops not to add the less technical name of lies, was the Popish Plot, a storm weathered warily by Charles II. Another was the tale of the Warming Pan, or the bogus heir to the throne, a storm that finally swept away James II. The last blow, however, could hardly have fallen but for one of those illogical but almost lovable localisms to which the English temperament is prone. The debate about the Church of England, then and now, differs from most debates in one vital point. It is not a debate about what an institution ought to do, or whether that institution ought to alter, but about what that institution actually is. One party, then as now, only cared for it because it was Catholic, and the other only cared for it because it was Protestant. Now, Something had certainly happened to the English quite inconceivable to the Scotch or the Irish. Masses of common people loved the Church of England without having even decided what it was. It had a hold different indeed from that of the medieval Church, but also very different from the barren prestige of gentility which clung to it in the succeeding century. Macaulay, with a widely different purpose in mind, devotes some pages to proving that an Anglican clergyman was socially a mere upper servant in the 17th century. He is probably right, but he does not guess that this was but the degenerate continuity of the more democratic priesthood of the Middle Ages. A priest was not treated as a gentleman, but a peasant was treated as a priest. And in England then, as in Europe now, many entertained the fancy that priesthood was a higher thing than gentility. In short, the National Church was then at least really national, in a fashion that was emotionally vivid, though intellectually vague. When, therefore, James II seemed to menace this practising communion, he aroused something at least more popular than the mere priggishness of the Whig lords. To this must be added a fact generally forgotten. I mean the fact that the influence then called popish was then in a real sense regarded as revolutionary. The Jesuit seemed to the English not merely a conspirator, but a sort of anarchist, There is something appalling about abstract speculations to many Englishmen, and the abstract speculations of Jesuits, like Suarez, dealt with extreme democracy and things undreamed of here. 
The last Stuart proposals for toleration seemed thus too many as vast and empty as atheism. The only 17th century Englishmen who had something of this transcendental abstraction were the Quakers, and the cosy English compromise shuddered when the two things shook hands. For it was something much more than a Stuart intrigue which made these philosophical extremes meet, merely because they were philosophical, and which brought the weary but humorous minds of Charles II into alliance with the subtle and detached spirit of William Penn. Much of England, then, was really alarmed at the Stuart scheme of toleration, sincere or insincere, because it seemed theoretical and therefore fanciful. It was in advance of its age, or, to use a more intelligent language, too thin and ethereal for its atmosphere. And to this affection for the actual in the English moderates must be added, in what proportion we do not know, a persecuting hatred of popery, almost maniacal but quite sincere. The state had long, as we have seen, been turned to an engine of torture against priests and the friends of priests. Men talk of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, but the English persecutors never had so tolerant an edict to revoke. But at least by this time the English, like the French, persecutors were oppressing a minority. Unfortunately, there was another province of government in which they were still more madly persecuting the majority. For it was here that came to its climax and took on its terrific character that lingering crime that was called the Government of Ireland. It would take too long to detail the close network of unnatural laws by which that country was covered till towards the end of the 18th century. It is enough to say here that the whole attitude to the Irish was tragically typified and tied up with our expulsion of the Stuarts in one of those acts that are remembered forever. James II, fleeing from the opinion of London, perhaps of England, eventually found refuge in Ireland, which took arms in his favour. The Prince of Orange, whom the aristocracy had summoned to the throne, landed in that country with an English and Dutch army, won the Battle of the Boyne, but saw his army successfully arrested before Limerick by the military genius of Patrick Sarsfield. The check was so complete that peace could only be restored by promising complete religious liberty to the Irish, in return for the surrender of Limerick. The new English government occupied the town and immediately broke the promise. It is not a matter on which there is much more to be said. It was a tragic necessity that the Irish should remember it, but it was far more tragic that the English forgot it. For he who has forgotten his sin is repeating it incessantly forever. But here again the Stuart position was much more vulnerable on this side of secular policy and especially of foreign policy. The aristocrats to whom power passed finally at the revolution were already ceasing to have any supernatural faith in Protestantism as against Catholicism but they had a very natural faith in England as against France, and even, in a certain sense, in English institutions as against French institutions. And just as these men, the most unmedieval of mankind, could yet boast about some medieval liberties, Magna Carta, the Parliament and the jury, so they could appeal to a true medieval legend in the matter of a war with France. A typical 18th century oligarch like Horace Walpole could complain that the Cicerone in the old church troubled him with traces of an irrelevant person named Saint Somebody when he was looking for the remains of John of Gaunt. He could say it with all the naivety of scepticism and never dream how far away from John of Gaunt he was really wandering in saying so. But though their notion of medieval history was a mere masquerade ball, it was one in which men fighting the French could still, in an ornamental way, 
put on the armour of the Black Prince or the crown of Henry of Monmouth. In this matter, in short, it is probable enough that the aristocrats were popular as patriots will always be popular. It is true that the last Stuarts were themselves far from unpatriotic, and James II, in particular, may well be called the founder of the British Navy. But their sympathies were with France, among other foreign countries. They took refuge in France, the elder before and the younger after his period of rule, and France aided the later Jacobite efforts to restore their line. And for the New England, especially the new English nobility, France was the enemy. The transformation through which the external relations of England passed at the end of the 17th century is symbolised by two very separate and definite steps. The first, the ascension of a Dutch king, and the second, the ascension of a German king. In the first were present all the features that can partially make an unnatural thing natural. In the second, we have the condition in which even those affecting it can hardly call it natural, but only call it necessary. William of Orange was like a gun dragged into the breach of a wall, a foreign gun indeed, and one fired in a quarrel more foreign than English, but still a quarrel in which the English and especially the English aristocrats, could play a great part. George of Hanover was simply something stuffed into a hole in the wall by English aristocrats, who practically admitted that they were simply stopping it with rubbish. In many ways William, cynical as he was, carried on the legend of the greater and grimmer Puritanism. He was, in private conviction, a Calvinist, and nobody knew or cared what George was except that he was not a Catholic. He was at home the partly Republican magistrate of what had once been a purely Republican experiment, and among the cleaner, if colder, ideals of the 17th century. George was, when he was at home, pretty much what the king of the Cannibal Islands was when he was at home, a savage personal ruler scarcely logical enough to be called a despot. William was a man of acute if narrow intelligence. George was a man of no intelligence. Above all, touching the immediate effect produced, William was married to a Stuart and ascended the throne hand in hand with a Stuart. He was a familiar figure and already a part of our royal family. With George, there entered England something that had scarcely been seen there before, something hardly mentioned in medieval or Renaissance writing, except as one mentions a Hottentot, the barbarian from beyond the Rhine. The reign of Queen Anne, which covers the period between these two foreign kings, is therefore the true time of transition. It is the bridge between the time when the aristocrats were at least weak enough to call in a strong man to help them, and the time when they were strong enough deliberately to call in a weak man who would allow them to help themselves. To symbolise is always to simplify, and to simplify too much, but the whole may be well symbolised as the struggle of two great figures, both gentlemen and men of genius both courageous and clear about their own aims, and in everything else a violent contrast at every point. One of them was Henry St. John, Lord Bolingbroke, the other was John Churchill, the famous and infamous Duke of Marlborough. The story of Churchill is primarily the story of the revolution and how it succeeded. The story of Bolingbroke is the story of the counter-revolution, and how it failed. Churchill is a type of the extraordinary time in this, that he combines the presence of glory with the absence of honour. When the new aristocracy had become normal to the nation in the next few generations, it produced personal types not only of aristocracy, but of chivalry. The revolution reduced us to a country wholly governed by gentlemen. The popular universities and schools of the Middle Ages, like their guilds and abbeys, 
had been seized and turned into what they are, factories of gentlemen, when they are not merely factories of snobs. It is hard now to realise that what we call the public schools were once undoubtedly public. By the revolution, they were already becoming as private as they are now. But at least in the 18th century, there were great gentlemen in the generous, perhaps too generous, sense now given to the title. Types not merely honest, but rash and romantic in their honesty, remain in the record with the names of Nelson or of Fox. We have already seen that the later reformers defaced from fanaticism the churches which the first reformers had defaced simply from avarice. Rather in the same way the 18th century Whigs often praised in a spirit of pure magnanimity what the 17th century Whigs had done in a spirit of pure meanness. How mean was that meanness can only be estimated by realising that a great military hero had not even the ordinary military virtues of loyalty to his flag or obedience to his superior officers, that he picked his way through campaigns that have made him immortal with the watchful spirit of a thieving camp follower. When William landed at Torbay on the invitation of the other Whig nobles, Churchill, as if to add something ideal to his imitation of Iscariot, went to James with wanton professions of love and loyalty, went forth in arms as if to defend the country from invasion, and then calmly handed the army over to the invader. To the finish of this work of art but few could aspire, but in their degree all the politicians of the revolution were upon this ethical pattern. While they surrendered the throne of James, there was scarcely one of them who was not in correspondence with William. When they afterwards surrounded the throne of William, there was not one of them who was not still in correspondence with James. It was such men who defeated Irish Jacobitism by the treason of Limerick. It was such men who defeated Scottish Jacobitism by the treason of Glencoe. Thus, the strange yet splendid story of 18th century England is one of greatness founded on smallness, a pyramid standing on a point, or, to vary the metaphor, the new mercantile oligarchy might be symbolised even in the externals of its great sister, the mercantile oligarchy of Venice. The solidity was all in the superstructure, the fluctuation had been all in the foundations. The great temple of Chatham and Warren Hastings was reared in its origins on things as unstable as water and as fugitive as foam. It is only a fancy, of course, to connect the unstable element with something restless and even shifty in the lords of the sea. But there was certainly in the Genesis, if not in the later generations of our mercantile aristocracy, a thing only too mercantile. Something which had also been urged against as yet another example of that polity. Something called Punica Fides. The great royalist Strafford, going disillusioned to death, had said, Put not your trust in princes. The great royalist Bolingbroke may well be said to have retorted, And least of all in merchant princes. Bolingbroke stands for a whole body of conviction which bulked very big in English history, but which, with the recent winding of the course of history, has gone out of sight. Yet, without grasping it, we cannot understand our past, nor, I will add, our future. Curiously enough, the best English books of the 18th century are crammed with it, yet modern culture cannot see it when it is there. Dr. Johnson is full of it. It is what he meant when he denounced minority rule in Ireland, as well as when he said that the devil was with the first Whig. Goldsmith is full of it. It is the whole point of that fine poem, The Deserted Village, and it is set out theoretically with great lucidity and spirit in The Vicar of Wakefield. Swift is full of it, 
and found in it an intellectual brotherhood in arms with Bolingbroke himself. In the time of Queen Anne, it was probably the opinion of the majority of people in England, but it was not in Ireland that the minority had begun to rule. This conviction, as brilliantly expounded by Bolingbroke, had many aspects. Perhaps the most practical was the point that one of the virtues of a despot is distance. It is the little tyrant of the fields that poisons human life. The thesis involved the truism that a good king is not only a good thing, but perhaps the best thing. But it also involved the paradox that even a bad king is a good king, for his oppression weakens the nobility and relieves the pressure on the populace. If he is a tyrant, he chiefly tortures the torturers, and though Nero's murder of his own mother was hardly perhaps a gain to his soul, it was no great loss to his empire. Bolingbroke had thus a wholly rationalistic theory of Jacobitism. He was, in other respects, a fine and typical 18th century intellect, a free-thinking deist, a clear and classic writer of English. But he was also a man of adventurous spirit and splendid political courage, and he made one last throw for the Stuarts. It was defeated by the great Whig nobles who formed the committee of the new regime of the gentry. And, considering who it was who defeated it, it is almost unnecessary to say that it was defeated by a trick. The small German prince ascended the throne, or rather was hoisted into it like a dummy, and the great royalist went into exile. Twenty years afterwards, he reappears and reasserts his living and logical faith in a popular monarchy. But it is typical of the whole detachment and distinction of his mind that for this abstract ideal he was willing to strengthen the heir of the king whom he had tried to exclude. He was always a royalist, but never a Jacobite. What he cared for was not a royal family, but a royal office. He celebrated it in his great book, The Patriot King, written in exile, and when he thought that George's great-grandson was enough of a patriot, he only wished that he might be more of a king. He made in his old age yet another attempt with such unpromising instruments as George III and Lord Bute, and when these broke in his hand, he died with all the dignity of the said Victor Cantoni. The great commercial aristocracy grew on in its full statue, but if we wish to realise the good and ill of its growth, there is no better summary than this section from the first to the last of the foiled coup d'etat of Bolingbroke. In the first, his policy made peace with France, and broke the connection with Austria. In the second, his policy again made peace with France and broke the connection with Prussia. For in that interval, the seed of the money-lending squires of Brandenburg had waxed mightily and had already become that prodigy which has become so enormous a problem in Europe. By the end of this epoch, Chatham, who incarnated and even created, at least in a representative sense, all that we call the British Empire, was at the height of his own and his country's glory. He summarised the New England of the Revolution in everything, especially in everything in which that movement seems to many to be intrinsically contradictory, and yet was most corporately consistent. Thus, he was a Whig, and even in some ways what we should call a liberal, like his son after him, but he was also an imperialist and what we should call a jingo, and the Whig party was consistently the jingo party. He was an aristocrat, in the sense that all our public men were then aristocrats, but he was very emphatically what may be called a commercialist, one might almost say a Carthaginian. In this connection, he has the characteristic which perhaps humanised but was not allowed to hamper the aristocratic plan. 
I mean that he could use the middle classes. It was a young soldier of middle rank, James Wolfe, who fell gloriously driving the French out of Quebec. It was a young clerk of the East India Company, Robert Clive, who threw open to the English the golden gates of India. But it was precisely one of the strong points of this 18th century aristocracy that it wielded without friction the wealthier bourgeoisie. It was not there that the social cleavage was to come. He was an eloquent parliamentary orator, and though Parliament was as narrow as a Senate, it was one of great senators. The very word recalls the role of those noble Roman phrases they often used, which we are right in calling classic, but wrong in calling cold. In some ways, nothing could be further from all this fine, if florid scholarship, all this princely and patrician gentility, all this air of freedom and adventure on the sea, than the little island state of the stingy drill sergeants of Potsdam hammering mere savages into mere soldiers. And yet the great chief of these was in some ways like a shadow of Chatham flung across the world, the sort of shadow that is at once an enlargement and a caricature. The English lords, whose paganism was ennobled by patronism, saw here something drawn out long and thin out of their own theories. What was paganism in Chatham was atheism in Frederick the Great. And what was in the first patriotism was in the second something with no name but Prussianism. The cannibal theory of a commonwealth, that it can of its nature eat each other commonwealths, had entered Christendom. Its autocracy and our own aristocracy drew indirectly nearer together, and seemed for a time to be wedded, but not before the great Bolingbroke had made a dying gesture, as if to forbid the bands. Fifteen. The War with the Great Republics We cannot understand the 18th century so long as we suppose that rhetoric is artificial because it is artistic. We do not fall into this folly about any of the other arts. We talk of man picking out notes arranged in ivory on a wooden piano with much feeling, or of his pouring out his soul by scraping on catgut after a training as careful as an acrobat's but we are still haunted with a prejudice that verbal form and verbal effect must somehow be hypocritical when they are the link between things so living as a man and a mob. We doubt the feeling of the old-fashioned orator because his periods are so rounded and pointed as to convey his feeling. Now, before any criticism of the 18th century worthies must be put the proviso of their perfect artistic sincerity. Their oratory was unrhymed poetry, and it had the humanity of poetry. It was not even unmetrical poetry. That century is full of great phrases, often spoken on the spur of great moments, which have in them the throb of recurrence of song, as of a man thinking to a tune. Nelson's, in honour I gained them, in honour I will die with them, has more rhythm than much that is called ver libre. Patrick Henry's, give me liberty or give me death, might be a great line in Walt Whitman. It is one of the many quaint perversities of the English to pretend to be bad speakers. But in fact, the most English 18th century epoch blazed with brilliant speakers. There may have been finer writing in France. There was no such fine speaking as in England. The Parliament had faults enough, but it was sincere enough to be rhetorical. The Parliament was corrupt, as it is now, though the examples of corruption were then often really made examples, in the sense of warnings, where they are now examples only in the sense of patterns. The Parliament was indifferent to the constituencies, as it is now, though perhaps the constituencies were less indifferent to the Parliament, 
The Parliament was snobbish, as it is now, though perhaps more respectful to mere rank and less to mere wealth. But the Parliament was a Parliament. It did fulfil its name and duty by talking and trying to talk well. It did not merely do things because they do not bear talking about, as it does now. It was then, to the eternal glory of our country, a great talking shop, not a mere buying and selling shop for financial tips and official places. And as with any other artist, the care the 18th century man expended an oratory is a proof of his sincerity, not a disproof of it. An enthusiastic eulogium by Burke is as rich and elaborate as a lover's sonnet. But it is because Burke is really enthusiastic, like the lover. An angry sentence by Junius is as carefully compounded as a Renaissance poison. But it is because Junius is really angry, like the poisoner. Now, nobody who has realised this psychological truth can doubt for a moment that many of the English aristocrats of the 18th century had a real enthusiasm for liberty. Their voices lift like trumpets upon the very word. Whatever their immediate forebears may have meant, these men meant what they said when they talked of the high memory of Hamden or the majesty of Magna Carta. Those patriots whom Walpole called the boys included many who really were patriots, or better still, who really were boys. If we prepare to put it so, among the Whig aristocrats were many who really were Whigs. Whigs by all the ideal definitions which identified the party with the defence of law against tyrants and courtiers. But if anybody deduces from the fact that the Whig aristocrats were Whigs any doubt about whether the Whig aristocrats were aristocrats, there is one practical test and reply. It might be tested in many ways, by the game laws and enclosure laws they passed, or by the strict code of the duel and the definition of honour on which they all insisted. But if it be really questioned whether I am right in calling their whole world an aristocracy, and the very reverse of it a democracy, the true historical test is this, that when republicanism really entered the world, they instantly waged two great wars with it, or, if the view be preferred, it instantly waged two great wars with them. America and France revealed the real nature of the English Parliament. Ice may sparkle, but a real spark will show it is only ice. So when the red fire of the revolution touched the frosty splendours of the Whigs, there was instantly a hissing and a strife, a strife of the flame to melt the ice, of the water to quench the flame. It has been noted that one of the virtues of the aristocrats was liberty, especially liberty among themselves. It might even be said that one of the virtues of the aristocrats was cynicism. They were not stuffed with our fashionable fiction, with its stiff and wooden figures of a good man named Washington and a bad man named Boney. They at least were aware that Washington's cause was not so obviously white, nor Napoleon's so obviously black as most books in general circulation would indicate. They had a natural admiration for the military genius of Washington and Napoleon. They had the most unmixed contempt for the German royal family. But they were, as a class, not only against both Washington and Napoleon, but against them both for the same reason. And it was that they both stood for democracy. Great injustice is done to the English aristocratic government of the time through a failure to realise this fundamental difference especially in the case of America. There is a wrong-headed humour about the English which appears especially in this, that while they often, as in the case of Ireland, make themselves out right where they were entirely wrong, they are easily persuaded, as in the case of America, to make themselves out entirely wrong where there is at least a case for their having been more or less right. George III's government laid certain taxes on the colonial community on the eastern seaboard of America. 
it was certainly not self-evident, in the sense of law and precedent, that the imperial government could not lay taxes on such colonists. Nor were the taxes themselves of that practically oppressive sort which rightly raise everywhere the common casuistry of revolution. The Whig oligarchs had their faults, but utter lack of sympathy with liberty, especially local liberty, and with their adventurous kindred beyond the seas, was by no means one of their faults. Chatham, the great chief of the new and very national noblesse, was typical of them in being free from the faintest illiberality and irritation against the colonies as such. He would have made them free of even favoured colonies if only he could have kept them as colonies. Burke, who was then the eloquent voice of Whiggism, and was destined later to show how holy it was a voice of aristocracy, went, of course, even further. Even North compromised, and though George III, being a fool, might himself have refused to compromise, he had already failed to effect the Bolingbroke scheme of the restitution of the royal power. The case for the Americans, the real reason for calling them right in the quarrel, was something much deeper than the quarrel. They were at issue, not with a dead monarchy, but with a living aristocracy. They declared war on something much finer and more formidable than poor old George. Nevertheless, the popular tradition, especially in America, has pictured it primarily as a duel of George III and George Washington. And, as we have noticed more than once, such pictures, though figurative, are seldom false. King George's head was not much more useful on the throne than it was on the signboard of a tavern. Nevertheless, the signboard was really a sign, and a sign of the times. It stood for a tavern that sold not English, but German beer. It stood for that side of the Whig policy which Chatham showed when he was tolerant to America alone, but intolerant of America when allied with France. That very wooden sign stood, in short, for the same thing as the juncture with Frederick the Great. It stood for that Anglo-German alliance which, at a very much later time in history, was to turn into the world-old Teutonic race. Roughly and frankly speaking, we may say that America forced the quarrel. She wished to be separate, which was to her but another phrase for wishing to be free. She was not thinking of her wrongs as a colony, but already of her rights as a republic. The negative effect of so small a difference could never have changed the world, without the positive effect of a great ideal, one may say of a great new religion. The real case for the colonists is that they felt they could be something, which they also felt, and justly, that England would not help them to be. England would probably have allowed the colonists all sorts of concessions and constitutional privileges, but England could not allow the colonists equality. I do not mean equality with her, but even with each other. Chatham might have compromised with Washington because Washington was a gentleman, but Chatham could hardly have conceived a country not governed by gentlemen. Burke was apparently ready to grant everything to America, but he would not have been ready to grant what America eventually gained. If he had seen American democracy, he would have been as much appalled by it as he was by French democracy, and would always have been by any democracy. In a word, the Whigs were liberal and even generous aristocrats, but they were aristocrats. That is why their concessions were as vain as their conquests. We talk, with a humiliation too rare with us, about our dubious part in the secession of America. Whether it increase or decrease the humiliation, I do not know, but I strongly suspect that we had very little to do with it. I believe we counted for uncommonly little in the case. We did not really drive away the American colonists, nor were they driven. They were led on by a light that went before. That light came from France, like the armies of Lafayette, that came to the help of Washington, 
France was already in travail with the tremendous spiritual revolution which was soon to reshape the world. Her doctrine, disruptive and creative, was widely misunderstood at the time and is much misunderstood still, despite the splendid clarity of style in which it was stated by Rousseau in the Contrat Social and by Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. Say the very word equality in many modern countries and 400 fools will leap to their feet at once to explain that some men can be found on careful examination to be taller or handsomer than others. As if Danton had not noticed that he was taller than Robespierre or as if Washington was not well aware that he was handsomer than Franklin. This is no place to expound a philosophy. It will be enough to say in passing by way of a parable, that when we say that all pennies are equal, we do not mean that they all look exactly the same. We mean that they are absolutely equal in their one absolute character, in their most important thing about them. It may be put practically by saying that they are coins of a certain value, twelve of which go to a shilling. It may be put symbolically and even mystically by saying that they all bear the image of the king. And though the most mystical, it is also the most practical summary of equality that all men bear the image of the king of kings. Indeed, it is of course true that this idea had long underlain all Christianity. Even in institutions less popular in form than were, for instance, the mob of medieval republics in Italy. A dogma of equal duties implies that of equal rights. I know of no Christian authority that would not admit that it is as wicked to murder a poor man as a rich man, or as bad to burgle an inelegantly furnished house as a tastefully furnished one. But the world had wandered further and further from these truisms, and nobody in the world was further from them than the group of the great English aristocrats. The idea of the equality of men is, in substance, simply the idea of the importance of man. But it was precisely the notion of the importance of a mere man which seemed startling and indecent to a society whose whole romance and religion now consisted of the importance of a gentleman. It was as if a man had walked naked into Parliament. There is not space here to develop the moral issue in full, but this will suffice to show that the critics concerned about the difference in human types or talents are considerably wasting their time. If they can understand how two coins can count the same, though one is bright and the other brown, they might perhaps understand how two men can vote the same, though one is bright and the other dull. If, however, they are still satisfied with their solid objection that some men are dull, I can only gravely agree with them that some men are very dull. But a few years after Lafayette had returned from helping to found a republic in America, he was flung over his own frontiers for resisting the foundation of a republic in France. So furious was the onward stride of this new spirit that the republican of the new world lived to be the reactionary of the old. For when France passed from theory to practice, the question was put to the world in a way not thinkable in connection with the prefatory experiment of a thin population on a colonial coast. The mightiest of human monarchies, like some monstrous immeasurable idol of iron, was melted down in a furnace barely bigger than itself, and recast in a size equally colossal, but in a shape men could not understand. Many, at least, could not understand it, at least of all the liberal aristocracy of England. There were, of course, practical reasons for a continuous foreign policy against France, whether royal or republican. There was primarily the desire to keep any foreigner from menacing us from the Flemish coast. There was, to a much lesser extent, the colonial rivalry in which so much English glory had been gained by the statesmanship of Chatham and the arms of Wolfe and of Clive. 
the former reason has returned on us with a singular irony. For in order to keep the French out of Flanders, we flung ourselves with increasing enthusiasm into a fraternity with the Germans. We purposely fed and pampered the power which was destined in the future to devour Belgium as France would never have devoured it, and threatened us across the sea with terrors of which no Frenchman would ever dream. But indeed, much deeper things unified our attitude towards France before and after the revolution. It is but one stride from depotism to democracy, in logic as well as in history, and oligarchy is equally remote from both. The Bastille fell, and it seemed to an Englishman merely that a deposit had turned into a demos. The young Bonaparte rose, and it seemed to an Englishman merely that a demos had once more turned into a deposit. He was not wrong in thinking these allotropic forms of the same alien thing, and that thing was equality. For when millions are equally subject to one law, it makes little difference if they are also subject to one lawgiver. The general social life is a level. The one thing that the English have never understood about Napoleon in all their myriad studies of his mysterious personality is how impersonal he was. I had almost said how unimportant he was. He said himself, I shall go down to history with my code in my hand. But in practical effects, as distant from mere name and renown, it would be even truer to say that his code will go down in history with his hand set to it in signature, somewhat illegibly. Thus, his testamentary law has broken up big estates and encouraged contented peasants in places where his name is cursed, in places where his name is almost unknown. In his lifetime, of course, it was natural that the annihilating splendour of his military strokes should rivet the eye like flashes of lightning. But his reign fell more silently, and its refreshment remained. It is needless to repeat here that, after bursting one world coalition after another by battles that are masterpieces of the military art, he was finally worn down by two comparatively popular courses the resistance of Russia and the resistance of Spain. The former was largely, like so much that is Russian, religious, but in the latter appeared most conspicuously that which concerns us here, the valour, vigilance and high national spirit of England in the 18th century. The long Spanish campaign tried and made triumphant the great Irish soldier, afterwards known as Wellington, who has become all the more symbolic since he was finally confronted with Napoleon in the last defeat of the latter at Waterloo. Wellington, though too logical to be at all English, was in many ways typical of the aristocracy. He had irony and independence of mind. But if we wish to realise how rigidly such men remained limited by their class, how little they really knew what was happening in their time, it is enough to note that Wellington seems to have thought he had dismissed Napoleon by saying he was not really a gentleman. If an acute and experienced Chinaman were to say of Chinese Gordon, he is not actually a Mandarin, we should think that the Chinese system deserved its reputation for being both rigid and remote. But the very name of Wellington is enough to suggest another, and with it the reminder that this, though true, is inadequate. There was some truth in the idea that the Englishman was never so English as when he was outside England, and never smacked so much of the soil as when he was on the sea. There has run through the national psychology something that has never had a name except the eccentric and indeed extraordinary name of Robinson Crusoe, which is all the more English for being quite undiscoverable in England. It may be doubted if a French or German boy especially wishes that his cornland or vineland were a desert, but many an English boy has wished that his island were a desert island. But we might even say that the Englishman was too insular for an island, and, 
He awoke most to life when his island was sundered from the foundations of the world, when it hung like a planet and flew like a bird. And, by a contradiction, the real British army was in the navy. The boldest of the islanders were scattered over the moving archipelago of a great fleet. There still lay on it, like an increasing light, the legend of the Armada. It was a great fleet full of the glory of having once been a small one. Long before Wellington ever saw Waterloo, the ships had done their work and shattered the French navy in the Spanish seas, leaving like a light upon the sea the life and death of Nelson, who died with his stars on his bosom and his heart upon his sleeve. There is no word for the memory of Nelson except to call him mythical. The very hour of his death, the very name of his ship, and touched with that epic completeness which critics call the long arm of coincidence and prophets the hand of God. His very faults and failures were heroic, not in a loose but in a classic sense, in that he fell only like the legendary heroes, weakened by a woman, not foiled by any foe among men and he remains the incarnation of a spirit in the English that is purely poetic. So poetic that it fancies itself a thousand things, and sometimes even fancies itself prosaic. At a recent date, in an age of reason, in a country already calling itself dull and businesslike, with top hats and factory chimneys already beginning to rise like towers of funeral efficiency, this country's clergyman's son moved to the last in a luminous cloud and acted a fairy tale. He shall remain as a lesson to those who do not understand England and a mystery to those who think they do. In outward action, he led his ships to victory and died upon a foreign sea. But symbolically, he established something indescribable and intimate something that sounds like a native proverb. He was the man who burned his ships and who forever set the Thames on fire. Sixteen. Aristocracy and the Discontents It is the pathos of many hackneyed things that they are intrinsically delicate and are only mechanically made dull. Anyone who has seen the first white light when it comes in by a window knows that daylight is not only as beautiful but as mysterious as moonlight. It is the subtlety of the colour of sunshine that seems to be colourless. So patriotism, and especially English patriotism, which is vulgarised with volumes of verbal fog and gas, is still in itself something as tenuous and tender as a climate. The name of Nelson, with which the last chapter ended, might very well summarise the matter, for his name is banged and beaten about like an old tin can, while his soul had something in it of a fine and fragile eighteenth-century vase. And it will be found that the most threadbare things contemporary and connected with him have a real truth to the tone and meaning of his life and time though for us they have too often degenerated into dead jokes. The expression, hearts of oak, for instance, is no unhappy phrase for the finer side of that England of which he was the best expression. Even as a material metaphor, it covers much of what I mean. Oak was by no means only made into bludgeons, nor even only into battleships and the English gentry did not think it businesslike to pretend to be mere brutes. The mere name of Oak calls back like a dream those dark but genial interiors of colleges and country houses, in which great gentlemen, not degenerate, almost made Latin an English language and port an English wine. Some part of that world at least will not perish, for its autumnal glow passed into the brush of the great English portrait painters, who, more than any other men, were given the power to commemorate the large humanity of their own land, immortalising a mood as broad and soft as their own brushwork. 
come naturally, at the right emotional angle, upon a canvas of Gainsborough, who painted ladies like landscapes, as great and as unconscious with repose, and you will note how subtly the artist gives to a dress flowing in the foreground something of the divine quality of distance. Then you will understand another faded phrase and word spoken far away upon the sea. They will rise up quite fresh before you and be born upon a bar of music, like words you have never heard before, for England, home and beauty. When I think of these things, I have no temptation to mere grumbling at the great gentry that waged the great war of our fathers. But indeed, the difficulty about it was something much deeper than could be dealt with by any grumbling. It was an exclusive class, but not an exclusive life. It was interested in all things, though not for all men. Or rather, those things it failed to include— through the limitations of this rationalist interval between medieval and modern mysticism, were at least not of the sort to shock us with superficial inhumanity. The greatest gap in their souls, for those who think it a gap, was their complete and complacent paganism. All their very decencies assumed that the old faith was dead. Those who held it still, like the great Johnson, were considered eccentrics. The French Revolution was a riot that broke up the very formal funeral of Christianity, and was followed by various other complications, including the corpse coming to life. But the scepticism was no mere oligarch orgy. It was not confined to the Hellfire Club, which might, in virtue of its vivid name, be regarded as relatively orthodox. It is present in the mildest middle-class atmosphere as in the middle-class masterpiece about Northanger Abbey, where we actually remember it as an antiquity without ever remembering it as an abbey. Indeed, there is no clearer case of it than what can only be called the atheism of Jane Austen. Unfortunately, it could truly be said of the English gentleman as of another gallant and gracious individual, that his honour stood rooted in dishonour. He was, indeed, somewhat in the position of such an aristocrat in a romance, whose splendour has the dark spot of a secret and a sort of blackmail. There was, to begin with, an uncomfortable paradox in the tale of his pedigree. Many heroes have claimed to be descended from the gods, from beings greater than themselves, but he himself was far more heroic than his ancestors. His glory did not come from the Crusades, but from the great pillage. His fathers had not come over with William the Conqueror, but only assisted, in a somewhat shuffling manner, at the coming over of William of Orange. His own exploits were often really romantic, in the cities of the Indian sultans or the war of the wooden ships, It was the exploits of the far-off founders of his family that were painfully realistic. In this, the great gentry were more in the position of Napoleonic marshals than of Norman knights. But their position was worse, for the marshals might be descended from peasants and shopkeepers. But the oligarchs were descended from usurers and thieves. That, for good or evil, was the paradox of England. The typical aristocrat was the typical upstart. But the secret was worse. Not only was such a family founded on stealing, but the family was stealing still. It is a grim truth that all through the 18th century, all through the great Whig speeches about liberty, all through the great Tory speeches about patriotism, through the period of Wandiwash and Placey, Through the period of Trafalgar and Waterloo, one process was steadily going on in the central Senate of the nation. Parliament was passing bill after bill for the enclosure by the great landlords of such of the common land as had survived out of the great communal system in the Middle Ages. It is much more than a pun. It is the prime political irony of our history that the commons were destroying the commons. The very word common 
as we have before noted, lost its great moral meaning and became a mere topographical term for some remaining scrap or scrub or heath that was not worth stealing. In the 18th century, these last and lingering commons were connected only with stories about highwaymen, which still linger in our literature. The romance of them was a romance of robbers, but not of the real robbers. This was the mysterious sin of the English squires, that they remained human and yet ruined humanity all around them. Their own ideal, nay their own reality of life, was really more generous and genial than the stiff savagery of Puritan captains and Prussian nobles, but the land withered under their smile as under an alien frown. Being still at least English, they were still in their way good-natured, but their position was false, and a false position forces the good-natured into brutality. The French Revolution was the challenge that really revealed to the Whigs that they must make up their minds to be really Democrats or admit that they were really aristocrats. They decided, as in the case of their philosophic exponent Burke, to be really aristocrats, and the result was the White Terror, the period of anti-Jacobin repression which revealed the real side of their sympathies more than any stricken fields in foreign lands. Cobbett, the last and greatest of the yeomen, of the small farming class which the great estates were devouring daily, was thrown into prison merely for protesting against the flogging of English soldiers by German mercenaries. In that savage dispersal of a peaceful meeting which was called the Massacre of Peterloo, English soldiers were indeed employed, though much more in the spirit of German ones, and it is one of the bitter satires that cling to the very continuity of our history that such suppression of the old yeoman spirit was the work of soldiers who still bore the title of the yeomanry. The name of Cobbett is very important here, indeed it is generally ignored because it is important. Cobbett was the one man who saw the tendency of the time as a whole, and challenged it as a whole. Consequently, he went without support. It is a mark of our whole modern history that the masses are kept quiet with a fight. They are kept quiet by the fight because it is a sham fight. Thus, most of us know by this time that the party system has been popular only in the same sense that a football match is popular. The division in Cobit's time was slightly more sincere, but almost as superficial, it was a difference of sentiment about externals which divided the old agricultural gentry of the 18th century from the new mercantile gentry of the 19th. Through the first half of the 19th century, there were some real disputes between the squire and the merchant. The merchant became converted to the important economic thesis of free trade and accused the squire of starving the poor by dear bread to keep up his agrarian privilege. Later, the squire retorted not ineffectively by accusing the merchant of brutalising the poor by overworking them in his factories to keep up his commercial success. The passing of the factory acts was a confession of the cruelty that underlay the new industrial experiments just as the repeal of the Corn Laws was a confession of the comparative weakness and unpopularity of the squires who had destroyed the last remnants of any peasantry that might have defended the field against the factory. These relatively real disputes would bring us to the middle of the Victorian era. But long before the beginning of the Victorian era, Cobbett had seen and said that the disputes were only relatively real, or rather he would have said, in his more robust fashion, that they were not real at all. He would have said that the agricultural pot and the industrial kettle were calling each other black, when they had both been blackened in the same kitchen. And he would have been substantially right, for the great industrial discipline of the kettle, James Watt, who learned from it the lesson of the steam engine, 
was typical of the age in this that he found the old trade guilds too fallen, unfashionable and out of touch with the times to help his discovery, so that he had recourse to the rich minority which had warred on and weakened those guilds since the Reformation. There was no prosperous peasant's pot, such as Henry of Navarre invoked, to enter into alliance with the kettle. In other words, there was, in the strict sense of the word, no commonwealth, because wealth, though more and more wealthy, was less and less common. Whether it be a credit or discredit, industrial science and enterprise were in bulk a new experiment of the old oligarchy, and the old oligarchy had always been ready for new experiments, beginning with the Reformation. And it is a characteristic of the clear mind which was hidden from many by the hot temper of Cobbett that he did see the Reformation as the root of both squirearchy and industrialism, and called on the people to break away from both. The people made more effort to do so than is commonly realised. There are many silences in our somewhat snobbish history, and when the educated class can easily suppress a revolt, they can still more easily suppress the record of it. It was so with some of the chief features of that great medieval revolution, the failure of which, or rather the betrayal of which, was the real turning point of our history. It was so with the revolts against the religious policy of Henry VIII, and it was so with the rick-burning and frame-breaking riots of Cobbett's epoch. The real mob reappeared for a moment in our history for just long enough to show one of the immortal marks of the real mob ritualism. There is nothing that strikes the undemocratic doctrinaire so sharply about direct democratic action as the vanity of mummery, or the things done seriously in the daylight, they astonish him by being as unpractical as a poem or a prayer. The French revolutionists stormed an empty prison merely because it was large and solid and difficult to storm, and therefore symbolic of the mighty monarchical machinery of which it had been but the shed. The English rioters laboriously broke in pieces a parish grindstone, merely because it was large and solid and difficult to break and therefore symbolic of the mighty oligarchical machinery which perpetually ground the faces of the poor. They also put the oppressive agent of some landlord in a cart and escorted him round the county, merely to exhibit his horrible personality to heaven and earth. Afterwards they let him go, which marks perhaps, for good or evil, a certain national modification of the movement. There is something very typical of an English revolution in having the tumbril without the guillotine. Anyhow, these embers of the revolutionary epoch were trodden out very brutally. The grindstone continued, and continues, to grind in the scriptural fashion above referred to, and in most political crises since. It is the crowd that has found itself in the cart, but of course both the riot and repression in England were but shadows of the awful revolt and vengeance which crowned the parallel process in Ireland. Here the terrorism, which was but a temporary and desperate tool of the aristocrats in England, not being, to do them justice at all consonant to their temperament, which had neither the cruelty and morbidity nor the logic and fixity of terrorism, became, in a more spiritual atmosphere, a flaming sword of religious and racial insanity. Pitt, the son of Chatham, was quite unfit to fill his father's place, unfit indeed, I cannot but think, to fill the place commonly given him in history. But if he was wholly worthy of his immortality, his Irish expedients, even if considered as immediately defensible, have not been worthy of their immortality. He was sincerely convinced of the national need to raise coalition after coalition against Napoleon. By pouring the commercial wealth, then rather peculiar to England upon her poor allies, and he did this with indutable talent and pertinacity.
He was, at the same time, faced with a hostile Irish rebellion and a partly or potentially hostile Irish parliament. He broke the latter by the most indecent bribery and the former by the most indecent brutality, but he may well have thought himself entitled to the tyrant's plea. But not only were his expeditions those of panic, or at any rate of peril, but, what is less clearly realised, it is the only real defence of them that they were those of panic and peril. He was ready to emancipate Catholics as such, for religious bigotry was not the vice of the oligarchy, but he was not ready to emancipate Irishmen as such. He did not really want to enlist Ireland like a recruit, but simply to disarm Ireland like an enemy. Hence, his settlement was from the first in a false position for settling anything. The union may have been a necessity, but the union was not a union. It was not indeed to be one, and nobody has ever treated it as one. We have not only never succeeded in making Ireland English, as Burgundy has been made French, but we have never tried. Burgundy could boast of Cornet, though Cornet was a Norman, but we should smile if Ireland boasted of Shakespeare. Our vanity has involved us in a mere contradiction. We have tried to combine identification with superiority. It is simply weak-minded to sneer at an Irishman if he figures as an Englishman, and rail at him if he figures as an Irishman. So the Union has never even applied English laws to Ireland, but only coercions and concessions, both specially designed for Ireland. From Pitt's time to our own, this tottering alternation has continued. From the time when the great O'Connell, with his monster meetings, forced our government to listen to Catholic emancipation, to the time when the great Parnell, with his obstruction, forced it to listen to home rule, a staggering equilibrium has been maintained by blows from without. In the later 19th century, the better sort of special treatment began on the whole to increase. Gladstone, an idealistic, though inconsistent liberal, rather belatedly realised that the freedom he loved in Greece and Italy had its rights nearer home, and may be said to have found a second youth in the gateway of the grave in the eloquence and emphasis of his conversion. And a statesman wearing the opposite label, for what that is worth, had the spiritual insight to see that Ireland, if resolved to be a nation, was even more resolved to be a peasantry. George Wyndham, generous, imaginative, a man among politicians, insisted that the agrarian agony of evictions, shootings and rack-rentings should end with the individual Irish getting, as Parnell had put it, a grip on their farms. In more ways than one, his work rounds off almost romantically the tragedy of the rebellion against Pitt, for Wyndham himself was of the blood of the leader of the rebels, and he wrought the only reparation yet made for all the blood shamefully shed that flowed around the fall of Fitzgerald. The effect on England was less tragic. Indeed, in a sense, it was comic. Wellington, himself an Irishman, though of the narrower party, was preeminently a realist, and, like many Irishmen, was especially a realist about Englishmen. He said the army he commanded was the scum of the earth, and the remark is nonetheless valuable because that army proved itself useful enough to be called the salt of the earth. But in truth, it was in this something of a national symbol, and the guardian, as it were, of a national secret. There is a paradox about the English, even as distinct from the Irish or the Scotch, which makes any formal version of their plans and principles inevitably unjust to them. England not only makes her ramparts out of rubbish, but she finds ramparts in what she herself cast away as rubbish. If it be a tribute to a thing to say that even its failures have been successes, there is truth in that tribute. Some of the best colonies were convict settlements – 
and might be called abandoned convict settlements. The army was largely an army of jailbirds raised by jail delivery, but it was a good army of bad men. Nay, it was a gay army of unfortunate men. This is the colour and the character that has run through the realities of English history and it can hardly be put in a book, least of all a historical book. It has its flashes in our fantastic fiction and in the songs of the street. But its true medium is conversation. It has no name but incongruity. An illogical laughter survives everything in the English soul. It survived, perhaps, with only too much patience, the time of terrorism in which the more serious Irish rose in revolt. That time was full of a quite topsy-turvy tyranny, and the English humorist stood on his head to suit it. Indeed, he often receives a quite irrational sentence in a police court by saying he will do it on his head. So, under Pitt's coercionist regime, a man was sent to prison for saying that George IV was fat. But we feel he must have been partly sustained in prison by the artistic contemplation of how fat he was. That sort of liberty, that sort of humanity, and it is no mean sort, did indeed survive all the drift and downward eddy of an evil economic system as well as the dragooning of a reactionary epoch and the drearier menace of materialistic social science, as embodied in the new Puritans who have purified themselves even of religion. Under this long process, the worst that can be said is that the English humorist has been slowly driven downwards in the social scale. Falstaff was a knight, Sam Weller was a gentleman's servant, and some of our recent restrictions seem designed to drive Sam Weller to the status of the artful dodger. But well it was for us that some such trampled tradition and dark memory of Merry England survived, well for us, as we shall see, that all our social science failed and all our statesmanship broke down before it. For there was to come the noise of a trumpet and a dreadful day of visitation, in which all the daily workers of a dull civilization were to be called out of their houses and their halls like a resurrection of the dead, and left naked under a strange sun with no religion but a sense of humour. And men might know of what nation Shakespeare was, who broke into puns and practical jokes in the darkest passion of his tragedies, if they had only heard those boys in France and Flanders who called out early doors themselves in a theatrical memory as they went so early in their youth to break down the doors of death. Seventeen. The Return of the Barbarian The only way to write a popular history, as we have already remarked, would be to write it backwards. It would be to take common objects of our own street and tell the tale of how each of them came to be in the street at all. And for my immediate purpose, it is really convenient to take two objects we have all known all our lives, as features of fashion or respectability. One, which has grown rarer recently, is what we call a top hat. The other, which is still a customary formality, is a pair of trousers. The history of these humorous objects really does give a clue to what has happened in England for the last hundred years. It is not necessary to be an aesthete in order to regard both objects as the reverse of beautiful. As tested by what may be called the rational side of beauty, the lines of human limbs can be beautiful, and so can the lines of loose drapery but not cylinders too loose to be the first and too tight to be the second. Nor is a subtle sense of harmony needed to see that while there are hundreds of differently proportioned hats, a hat that actually grows larger towards the top is somewhat top-heavy. But what is largely forgotten is this, 
that these two fantastic objects, which now strike the eye as unconscious freaks, were originally conscious freaks. Our ancestors, to do them justice, did not think them casual or commonplace. They thought them, if not ridiculous, at least rococo. The top hat was the topmost point of a riot of Regency dandyism, and Bucks wore trousers while businessmen were still wearing knee breeches. It will not be fanciful to see a certain oriental touch in trousers, which the later Romans also regarded as effeminately oriental. It was an oriental touch found in many florid things of the time, in Byron's poems or Brighton Pavilion, Now, the interesting point is that for a whole serious century, these instantaneous fantasies have remained like fossils. In the carnival of the Regency, a few fools got into fancy dress, and we have all remained in fancy dress. At least we have remained in the dress, though we have lost the fancy. I say this is typical of the most important thing that happened in the Victorian time. For the most important thing was that nothing happened. The very fuss that was made about minor modifications brings into relief the rigidity with which the main lines of social life were left as they were at the French Revolution. We talk of the French Revolution as something that changed the world, but its most important relation to England is that it did not change England. A student of our history is concerned rather with the effect it did not have than the effect it did. If it be a splendid fate to have survived the flood, the English oligarchy had that added splendour. But even for the countries in which the revolution was a convulsion, it was the last convulsion, until that which shakes the world today. It gave their character to all the commonwealths, which all talked about progress and were occupied in marking time. Frenchmen, under all superficial reactions, remained republican in spirit, as they had been when they first wore top hats. Englishmen, under all superficial reforms, remained oligarchical in spirit, as they had been when they first wore trousers. Only one power might be said to be growing and that in a plodding and prosaic fashion, the power in the northeast whose name was Prussia. And the English were more and more learning that this growth need cause them no alarm, since the North Germans were their cousins in blood and their brothers in spirit. The first thing to note, then, about the 19th century is that Europe remained herself as compared with the Europe of the Great War, and that England especially remained herself as compared even with the rest of Europe. Granted this, we may give their proper importance to the cautious internal changes in this country, the small conscious and the large unconscious changes. Most of the conscious ones were much upon the model of an earlier one, the Great Reform Bill of 1832, and can be considered in the light of it. First, From the standpoint of most real reformers, the chief thing about the Reform Bill was that it did not reform. It had a huge tide of popular enthusiasm behind it, which wholly disappeared when the people found themselves in front of it. It enfranchised large masses of the middle classes, it disenfranchised very definite bodies of the working classes, and it so struck the balance between the conservative and the dangerous elements in the Commonwealth that the governing class was rather stronger than before. The date, however, is important, not at all because it was the beginning of democracy, but because it was the beginning of the best way ever discovered of evading and postponing democracy. Here enters the homeopathic treatment of revolution since so often successful. Well into the next generation, Disraeli, the brilliant Jewish adventurer who was the symbol of the English aristocracy being no longer genuine, extended the franchise to the artisans 
partly, indeed, as a party move against his great rival Gladstone, but more as the method by which the old popular pressure was first tried out and then toned down. The politicians said the working class now was strong enough to be allowed votes. It would be truer to say that it was now weak enough to be allowed votes. So, in more recent times, payment of members, which would once have been regarded and resisted as an inrush of popular forces, was passed quietly and without resistance, and regarded merely as an extension of parliamentary privileges. The truth is that the old parliamentary oligarchy abandoned their first line of trenches because they had by that time constructed a second line of defence. It consisted in the concentration of colossal political funds in the private and irresponsible power of the politicians, collected by the sale of peerages and more important things and expended into the gerrymandering of the enormously expensive elections. In the presence of this inner obstacle, a vote became about as valuable as a railway ticket when there is a permanent block on the line. The facade and outward form of this new secret government is the merely mechanical application of what is called the party system. The party system does not consist, as some suppose, of two parties, but of one. If there were two real parties, there could be no system. But if this was the evolution of parliamentary reform as represented by the first reform bill, we can see the other side of it in the social reform attacked immediately after the first reform bill. It is a truth that should be a tower and a landmark that one of the first things done by the Reform Parliament was to establish those harsh and dehumanised workhouses which both honest radicals and honest Tories branded with the black title of the new Bastille. This bitter name lingers in our literature and can be found by the curious in the works of Carlyle and Hood but it is doubtless interesting rather as a note of contemporary indignation than as a correct comparison. It is easy to imagine the logicians and legal orators of the parliamentary school of progress finding many points of differentiation and even of contrast. The Bastille was one central institution. The workhouses have been many and have everywhere transformed local life with whatever they have to give of social sympathy and inspiration. Men of high rank and great wealth were frequently sent to the Bastille, but no such mistake has ever been made by the more business administration of the workhouse. Over the most capricious operations of the Lettre de Cachet, there still hovered some hazy traditional idea that a man is put in prison to punish him for something. It was the discovery of the later social science that men who cannot be punished can still be imprisoned. But the deepest and most decisive difference lies in the better fortune of the new Bastille, for no mob has ever dared to storm it, and it never fell. The new poor law was indeed not wholly new in the sense that it was the culmination and clear enunciation of a principle foreshadowed in the earlier poor law of Elizabeth, which was one of the many anti-popular effects of the great pillage. When the monasteries were swept away and the medieval system of hospitality destroyed, tramps and beggars became a problem the solution of which has always tended towards slavery, even when the question of slavery has been cleared of the irrelevant question of cruelty. It is obvious that a desperate man might find Mr. Bumble and the board of guardians less cruel than cold weather and the bare ground, even if he were allowed to sleep on the ground, which, by a veritable nightmare of nonsense and injustice, he is not.
he is actually punished for sleeping under a bush on the specific and stated ground that he cannot afford a bed. It is obvious, however, that he may find his best physical good by going into the workhouse, as he often found it in pagan times by selling himself into slavery. The point is that the solution remains servile, even when Mr. Bumble and the Board of Guardians cease to be in a common sense cruel. The pagan might have the luck to sell himself to a kind master. The principle of the new poor law, which has so far proved permanent in our society, is that the man lost all his civic rights and lost them solely through poverty. There is a touch of irony, though hardly of mere hypocrisy, in the fact that the Parliament which effected this reform had just been abolishing black slavery by buying out the slave owners in the British colonies. The slave owners were bought out at a price big enough to be called blackmail, but it would be misunderstanding the national mentality to deny the sincerity of the sentiment. Wilberforce represented in this the real wave of Wesleyan religion, which had made a humane reaction against Calvinism, and was in no mean sense philanthropic. But there is something romantic in the English mind which can always see what is remote. It is the strongest example of what men lose by being long-sighted. It is fair to say that they gain many things also, the poems that are like adventures, and the adventures that are like poems. It is a national saviour, and therefore in itself neither good nor evil, and it depends on the application whether we find a spiritual text for it in the wish to take the wings of the morning and abide in the uttermost parts of the sea, or merely in the saying that the eyes of a fool are in the ends of the earth. Anyhow, the unconscious 19th century movement, so slow that it seems stationary, was altogether in this direction, of which workhouse philanthropy is the type. Nevertheless, it had one national institution to combat and overcome, one institution all the more intensely national because it was not official, and in a sense not even political. The modern Trade union was the inspiration and creation of the English. It is still largely known throughout Europe by its English name. It was the English expression of the European effort to resist the tendency of capitalism to reach its natural culmination in slavery. In this, it has an almost weird psychological interest, for it is a return to the past by men ignorant of the past like the subconscious action of some man who has lost his memory. We say that history repeats itself, and it is even more interesting when it unconsciously repeats itself. No man on earth is kept so ignorant of the Middle Ages as the British workman, except perhaps the British businessman who employs him. Yet all who know even a little of the Middle Ages can see that the modern trade union is a groping for the ancient guild. It is true that those who took to the trade union, and even those clear-sighted enough to call it the guild, are often without the faintest tinge of medieval mysticism, or even of medieval morality. But this fact is itself the most striking and even staggering tribute to medieval morality. It has all the clinching logic of coincidence. If larger numbers of the most hard-headed atheists had evolved out of their own inner consciousness, the notion that a number of bachelors or spinsters ought to live together in celibate groups for the good of the poor or the observation of certain hours and offices it would be a very strong point in favour of the monasteries. It would be all the stronger if the atheists had never heard of monasteries. It would be strongest of all if they hated the very name of monasteries. And it is all the stronger because the man who puts his trust in trades unions does not call himself a Catholic or even a Christian, if he does call himself a guild socialist.
The trade union movement passed through many perils, including a ludicrous attempt of certain lawyers to condemn as a criminal conspiracy that trade union solidarity, of which their own profession is the strongest and most startling example in the world. The struggle culminated in gigantic strikes, which split the country in every direction in the earlier part of the 20th century. But another process, with much more power at its back, was also in operation. The principle represented by the new poor law proceeded on its course, and in one important respect altered its course, though it can hardly be said to have altered its object. It can most correctly be stated by saying that the employers themselves, who already organised business, began to organise social reform. It was more picturesquely expressed by a cynical aristocrat in Parliament who said, We are all socialists now. The socialists, a body of completely sincere men, led by several conspicuously brilliant men, had long hammered into men's heads the hopeless sterility of mere non-interference in exchange. The socialists proposed that the state should not merely interfere in business, but should take over the business, and pay all men as equal wage earners, or at any rate as wage earners. The employers were not willing to surrender their own position to the state, and this project has largely faded from politics. But the wiser of them were willing to pay better wages, and they were specially willing to bestow various other benefits, so long as they were bestowed after the manner of wages. Thus, we had a series of social reforms which, for good or evil, all tended in the same direction. The permission to employees to claim certain advantages as employees and as something permanently different from employers. Of these, the obvious examples were employers' liability, old age pensions, and, as marking another and more decisive stride in the process, the Insurance Act. The latter, in particular, and the whole plan of the social reform in general, were modelled upon Germany. Indeed, the whole English life of this period was overshadowed by Germany, We had now reached, for good or evil, the final fulfilment of that gathering influence which began to grow on us in the 17th century, which was solidified by the military alliances of the 18th century, and which, in the 19th century, had been turned into a philosophy, not to say a mythology. German metaphysics had thinned our theology, so that many a man's most solemn conviction about Good Friday was that Friday was named after Freya. German history had simply annexed English history, so that it was almost counted the duty of any patriotic Englishman to be proud of being a German. The genius of Carlyle, the culture preached by Matthew Arnold, would not, persuasive as they were, have alone produced this effect, but for an external phenomenon of great force. Our internal policy was transformed by our foreign policy, and foreign policy was dominated by the more and more drastic steps which the Prussian, now clearly the prince of all the German tribes, was taking to extend the German influence in the world. Denmark was robbed of two provinces, France was robbed of two provinces, and though the fall of Paris was felt almost everywhere as the fall of the capital of civilization, a thing like the sacking of Rome by the Goths, many of the most influential people in England still saw nothing in it but the solid success of our kinsmen and old allies of Waterloo. The moral methods which achieved it, the juggling with the Augustenberg claim, the forgery of the Ems telegram, were either successfully concealed or were but cloudily appreciated. The higher criticism had entered into our ethics as well as our theology. Our view of Europe was also distorted and made disproportionate by the accident of a natural concern for Constantinople and our route to India.
which led Palmerston and later premiers to support the Turk and see Russia as the only enemy. This somewhat cynical reaction was summed up in the strange figure of Disraeli, who made a pro-Turkish settlement full of his native indifference to the Christian subjects of Turkey and sealed it at Berlin in the presence of Bismarck. Disraeli was not without insight into the inconsistencies and illusions of the English. He said many sagacious things about them, and one especially when he told the Manchester School that their motto was peace and plenty amid a starving people and with the world in arms. But what he said about peace and plenty might well be parodied as a comment on what he himself said about peace with honour. Returning from that Berlin conference, he should have said, I bring you peace with honour peace with the seeds of the most horrible war of history, and honour as the dupes and victims of the old bully of Berlin. But it was, as we have seen, especially in social reform that Germany was believed to be leading the way, and to have found the secret of dealing with the economic evil. In the case of insurance, which was the test case, she was applauded for obliging all her workmen to set apart a portion of their wages for any time of sickness and numerous other provisions. Both in Germany and England pursued the same ideal, which was that of protecting the poor against themselves. It everywhere involved an external power having a finger in the family pie but little attention was paid to any friction thus caused, for all prejudices against the process were supposed to be the growth of ignorance. And that ignorance was already being attacked by what was called education, an enterprise also inspired largely by the example and partly by the commercial competition of Germany. It was pointed out that in Germany, governments and great employers thought it well worth their while to apply the grandest scale of organisation and the minutest inquisition of detail to the instruction of the whole German race. The government was the stronger for training its scholars as it trained its soldiers. The big businesses were the stronger for manufacturing mind as they manufactured material. English education was made compulsory. It was made free. Many good, earnest and enthusiastic men laboured to create a ladder of standards and examinations which would connect the cleverest of the poor with the culture of the English universities and the current teaching in history or philosophy. But it cannot be said that the connection was very complete or the achievement so thorough as the German achievement. For whatever reason, the poor Englishman remained in many things much as his father's had been, and seemed to think the higher criticism too high for him even to criticise. And then a day came, and if we were wise, we thanked God that we had failed. Education, if it had ever really been in question, would doubtless have been a noble gift. Education in the sense of the central tradition of history, with its freedom, its family honour, its chivalry, which is the flower of Christendom. But what would our populace in our epoch have actually learned if they had learned all that our schools and universities had to teach? That England was but a little branch on a large Teutonic tree, that an unfathomable spiritual sympathy, all encircling like the sea, had always made us the natural allies of the great folk by the flowing Rhine, that all light came from Luther and Lutheran Germany, whose science was still purging Christianity of its Greek and Roman assertions, that Germany was a forest fated to grow, that France was a dung heap fated to decay, a dung heap with a crowing cock on it. What would the ladder of education have led to, except a platform on which a posturing professor proved that a cousin German was the same as a German cousin?
What would the gutter snipe have learned as a graduate, except to embrace a Saxon because he was the other half of an Anglo-Saxon? The day came, and the ignorant fellow found he had other things to learn, and he was quicker than his educated countrymen, for he had nothing to unlearn. He, in whose honour all had been said and sung, stirred, and stepped across the border of Belgium. Then were spread out before men's eyes all the beauties of his culture and all the benefits of his organisation. Then we beheld under a lifting daybreak what light we had followed and after what image we had laboured to refashion ourselves. Nor in any story of mankind has the irony of God chosen the foolish things so catastrophically to confound the wise. For the common crowd of poor and ignorant Englishmen, because they only knew that they were Englishmen, burst through the filthy cobwebs of four hundred years and stood where their fathers stood when they knew that they were Christian men. The English poor, broken in every revolt, bullied by every fashion, long despoiled of property, and now being despoiled of liberty, entered history with a noise of trumpets, and turned themselves in two years into one of the iron armies of the world. And when the critic of politics and literature, feeling that this war is, after all, heroic, looks around him to find the hero, he can point to nothing but a mob. Eighteen. Conclusion In so small a book on so large a matter, finished hastily enough amid the necessities of an enormous national crisis, it would be absurd to pretend to have achieved proportion. But I will confess to some attempt to correct a disproportion. We talk of historical perspective, but I rather fancy there is too much perspective in history, for perspective makes a giant a pygmy, and a pygmy a giant. The past is a giant foreshortened with his feet towards us, and sometimes the feet are of clay. We see too much merely the sunset of the Middle Ages, even when we admire its colours, and the study of a man like Napoleon is too often that of the last phase. So there is a spirit that thinks it reasonable to deal in detail with old Sarum, and would think it ridiculous to deal in detail with the use of Sarum, or which erects in Kensington Gardens a golden monument to Albert larger than anybody has ever erected to Alfred. English history is misread especially, I think, because the crisis is missed. It is usually put about the period of the Stuarts, and many of the memorials of our past seem to suffer from the same visitation as the memorial of Mr. Dick. But though the story of the Stuarts was a tragedy, I think it was also an epilogue. I make the guess, for it can be no more, that the change really came with the fall of Richard II following on his failure to use medieval deputism in the interests of medieval democracy. England, like the other nations of Christendom, had been created not so much by the death of the ancient civilization as by its escape from death, or by its refusal to die. Medieval civilization had arisen out of the resistance to the barbarians, to the naked barbarism from the north and the more subtle barbarism from the east. It increased in liberties and local government under kings who controlled the wider things of war and taxation. And in the peasant war of the 14th century in England, the king and the populace came for a moment into conscious alliance. They both found that a third thing was already too strong for them. That third thing was the aristocracy, and it captured and called itself the Parliament. The House of Commons, as its name implies, had primarily consisted of plain men summoned by the king like jurymen. 
but it soon became a very special jury. It became, for good or evil, a great organ of government, surviving the church, the monarchy, and the mob. It did many great and not a few good things. It created what we call the British Empire. It created something which was really far more valuable, a new and natural sort of aristocracy, more humane and even humanitarian than most of the aristocracies of the world. It had sufficient sense of the instincts of the people, at least until lately, to respect the liberty and especially the laughter that had become almost the religion of the race. But in doing all this, it deliberately did two other things, which it thought a natural part of its policy. It took the side of the Protestants, and then, partly as a consequence, it took the side of the Germans. Until very lately, most intelligent Englishmen were quite honestly convinced that in both it was taking the side of progress against decay. The question which many of them are now inevitably asking themselves, and would ask whether I asked it or no, is whether it did not rather take the side of barbarism against civilization. At least, if there be anything valid in my own vision of these things, we have returned to an origin and we are back in the war with the barbarians. It falls as naturally for me that the Englishman and the Frenchman should be on the same side as that Alfred and Abu should be on the same side in that black century when the barbarians wasted Wessex and besieged Paris. But there are now perhaps less certain tests of the spiritual as distinct from the material victory of civilization. Ideas are more mixed, are complicated by fine shades or covered by fine names. And whether the retreating savage leaves behind him the soul of savagery, like a sickness in the air, I myself should judge primarily by one political and moral test. The soul of savagery is slavery. Under all its mask of machinery and instruction, the German regimentation of the poor was the relapse of barbarians into slavery. I can see no escape from it for ourselves in the ruts of our present reforms, but only by doing what the medievals did after the other barbarian defeat, beginning by guilds and small independent groups, gradually to restore the personal property of the poor and the personal freedom of the family. If the English really attempt that, the English have at least shown in the war, to anyone who doubted it, that they have not lost the courage and capacity of their fathers, and can carry it through if they will. If they do not do so, if they continue to move only with the dead momentum of the social discipline which we learnt from Germany, there is nothing before us but what Mr. Belloc, the discoverer of this great sociological drift, has called the servile state. And there are moods in which a man, considering that conclusion of our story, is half inclined to wish that the wave of Teutonic barbarism had washed out of us and our armies together, and that the world should never know anything more of the last of the English, except that they died for liberty. The End <laughs>